Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 166, Melchizedek, part 1A. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good. Better since uh, getting back home. Things can re- return to the normal level of chaos, I guess, but I like that. What sounds interesting, Mike, is what we're going to be covering here over the next three weeks. Melchizedek, there's so much information to cover. Oh, God. I, I, I don't even know what you're going to do. You yeah, your work cut out be, for you. Yeah, it's going to be three parts. You know, it uh, you might as well jump into it because there's just so much material about Melchizedek. And the reason there's a lot of material is because there's so many problems. There are so many points of confusion, so many points of ambiguity. So many uh, things you can see in the text and then go down two or three trails and trajectories and really rabbit holes in this case that uh, it's a challenge to to basically just cover it all, much less try to reach any sort of conclusions about a number of things. But we'll, you know, we'll do our best. We'll chop it up into three parts. And I don't think any of them are going to be short, but I know this one's not going to be short. So. In this first part, we're going to focus on Old Testament material. So we're not going to get into Second Temple Jewish stuff. That's going to be part two. And then, of course, New Testament material, part three. But obviously, parts two and three are going to build on this one. And you're going to see, I, I can telegraph this much here, you're going to see how certain uh, certain elaborations are made on the Old Testament material. And some would even use the word alterations in Second Temple Jewish literature and in the New Testament. The Old Testament stuff is adapted uh, in in a number of respects by Second Temple Jewish tradition and New Testament. And that's not to say, and we'll hit an example or two today, that that the New Testament or any any of this other material is making stuff up. It's just that they'll seize on a particular trajectory and then kind of run with it uh, or apply it in, in a different way that, you know, it could be a legitimate application, but you could apply it in two or three other ways too. So there's just a lot uh, here that there is to consider. This is one of those topics that is kind of a vortex. Um, A simple question like, who was Melchizedek, turns into a dozen other questions, most of which don't have clear-cut answers. And I I would say, again, this is easily one of the most complex topics in biblical studies. Let's just jump into the passages where Melchizedek is actually mentioned. We're going to start with Genesis 14. The other one is Psalm 110, but I'm, I'm going to stick here with Genesis 14, and we're going to spend a lot of time here, then we'll pick up Psalm 110 uh, at a certain point. So Genesis 14, 17 through 24 reads as follows, and I'm using the ESV. After his return from the defeat, of course, the person spoken of here is Abraham. After Abram's return from the defeat of Kedor Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah that is, the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him, that is, Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything, and the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. In other words, the people that Abram had saved. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Honor, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. And that's the end of the uh, the pericope, the little section there in Genesis 14. Now, there are a number of issues that arise just from, from what we read, and really even just a handful of the verses that we read. Each has a bearing on how later literature, Second Temple, Jewish literature, and New Testament material ought to be understood or how they can be understood. And it has a bearing on whether the other literature reinterprets what's going on here in Genesis 14 in a manner consistent with the original Old Testament passage. Now, this in turn has a bearing on Christology. We'll eventually get there when we get to the New Testament material, but and that'll actually build on some Second Temple material too. 
since the book of Hebrews links Jesus and Melchizedek in some way. And that, that's a little vague for right now, but we'll, we'll eventually get there. And what I say in part three, I hope will be sort of evident from what we cover in parts one and two. So for our starting point here in Genesis 14, we're going to begin with the name, just, just the name Melchizedek. You think, well, what's the big deal about that? Oh, there's, there's just a lot going on there. Now, in Hebrew, we have Malki Tzedek, basically two parts of the name. And I should note, I'm going to try to remember to do this for uh, Brenda, who, who does our, our transcripts, that sometimes academic works will take Tzedek and write it, transliterate it, T-S-E-D-E-Q or E-K. Or they will, instead of T-S, have S with a dot underneath. It's the T sound, T-S combined. And you know, there, nobody follows the same convention all the time. So either, either one of those is correct. It's the T-S sound. So the name Malki Tzedek. Now in the course of discussing the name, here's what we're going to hit. So just keep these things in your, in, in your head. We have to talk about the type of name this is in terms of historical Semitic analysis. We'll talk about what the name means, and we also need to talk about the theology that's sort of glommed onto or packed onto this name. And that's going to take us into the issue of Israelite religion, and that in turn is really going to be focused on the second half of the name, Tzedek, because I will telegraph this at, at this point, and we'll eventually return to it. Tzedek is a deity name. It's the name of a god, a Canaanite god. And so that is going to factor into what we have here, what we're looking at when we see Malki Tzedek in Genesis 14 and, and elsewhere. Now, many presume that Malki or Malki Tzedek means king of righteousness, since that is a wording adopted in the New Testament. Hebrews 7 2 interprets Melchizedek's name, again, Hebrew, Malki Tzedek as king of righteousness. And you can translate it that way, but the Hebrew is actually more flexible than that. Here are some questions to ask as we try to analyze the name. Is the name a Northwest Semitic personal name or not? If not, it might be a royal epithet, that is a title. So is, do we have a person's name here? Is, is Melchizedek, Melchizedek, is that a personal name? Is, is it actually the name of a person? Or is it a title? Okay, it, it could actually be either. and I'll explain why in a moment. Another consideration is, if it's not a name at all, again, and if it's a title, is there precedent for that view in the Old Testament, where you have something that looks like a personal name that might be a title? If, on the other hand, it is a personal name, it is, is it a theophoric name? or a descriptive name. Now, I need to unpack both those terms. Theophoric names are names that have a, a divine element in them, a deity name as part of them. So, you know, Malki Tzedek. If Tzedek is supposed to be understood as a deity name, then Melchizedek would be a theophoric name. One component of it would be a deity. Um, kind of like Jeremiah, Yermi Yahu. You know, Yahu at the end is the divine name, Yah. Okay. Uh, you know, Zedek, Zedek, Yahoo. Okay, we, we have all these these sorts of names in, in the Bible that part of the name is is the divine name or some some other deity name. Is Melchizedek one of those? Or is it just merely descriptive? In other words, going back to Hebrews 7, 2, king of righteousness, maybe Tzedek, that second part of the name, is not a deity name. Maybe it just, it's an adjective, and, and therefore it's descriptive. My king is righteous or king of righteousness. So there's all sorts of things, even with the name, to think about, and all of those things are possibilities. So let's take the name apart, uh, as scholars would do, and start thinking about each of them. So we have Malki Tzedek, two parts. We'll start with the spelling. The New Testament king of righteousness presumes that the name is what is called in Hebrew grammar a construct phrase. That means you two nouns next to each other. There's noun X, and then there's noun Y. So you have an X of Y relationship, this noun of that noun. So in this case, it would be the word for king, malk in Semitic, 
and then we'd have the word for righteous or righteousness. So king of righteousness, now, excuse me, king of righteousness, noun of noun, X of Y relationship. So that's possible. Okay. It, it's possible. However, there's actually something that's kind of in the way of this. The first part of the name is Malki. It's a noun, M-L-K, plus a suffix, that little E on the end, the little I letter. You cannot have, by rule of Hebrew grammar, a suffix in between two nouns in a construct phrase. So it looks like the little, that last little letter, that little I letter, it's, it's a yod in Hebrew. That shouldn't be there. It messes up the construct phrase. And if it's not a construct phrase, then, you know, what, what in the world's going on? It, it wouldn't be king of righteousness. It would be my king. There's the noun plus the suffix, mal key. My king is righteous, or my king is tzedek, the deity. So which one do we have? You know, is it a construct phrase or not? Now, there's a way to sort of get around this. Uh, there's something called the herek compogenus, which is a sort of an arcane point of Hebrew grammar and syntax that in, in most simple terms, the Y that, that is a suffix could actually be kind of a, you know, again, this is, this gets so technical so fast. It could be the vestige of a case system. In other words, it may not be a suffix after all, even though 99% of the time when you have this little Y on a noun, it's going to be a suffix. There are apparent exceptions. And so you might have this little letter in there that messes up the normal construct phrase, it might be okay. It might not be a suffix after all, and you might actually be able to translate it king of righteousness. But odds are, again, that, that wouldn't be the normative way to understand the phrase. So, you know, what do we do with this? Well, let, let's just go back here and say, okay, we've got two choices where we're at right now in our discussion. King of righteousness Right now, if, if we just look at the name, that's possible, but less likely. And that means we don't have a, an X of Y, king of righteousness. We don't have that X of Y relationship between nouns. We have something like my king is, fill in the blank, either righteous or tzedek. So we either have a theophoric name where a deity is part of it, my king is tzedek, whoever tzedek is. And again, we're going we're gonna to talk about tzedek as we continue. You either have that situation or you have some description. My king is righteous. It's either an adjective. Tzedek is either an adjective or a deity name. That would be the normative way of, of reading this. Now let's take the, the second one. My king is Tzedek for a moment. Tzedek is a deity. Very, it's, This is a known deity from Canaanite religion. And of course, Melchizedek is not an Israelite. He's not a, uh, he's not a descendant of Abraham. He is a Canaanite. So if we look at it as my king is Tzedek, and we'll again talk a little bit later about who Tzedek was and how that, how, how can that be reconciled with the Most High? Isn't that Yahweh? What, who's this Tzedek guy? You know? So we have to address that. We'll return to it. We're just focused on the name here. If we take it as my king is Tzedek, then, you know, we have, you know, we have something to, you know, not to worry about, but something to, to consider and, and try to parse. There are, other, there are other names like this, okay? There are examples of theophoric names in the Old Testament, as I mentioned. And a little bit of a wild card here. The first part of the name, MLK, that's also a deity name from Canaan. So you, you might actually have two deity names here. You could have my king is Tzedek, or if we take MLK as a deity name, you could have Melech or Malk, this isn't the way you, you, you know, we, this, this wouldn't be Molech. Okay, that would be something different. But you have MLK is righteous. So we have an MLK deity known from Canaan, and we have a Tzedek deity known from Canaan. So, you know, what do we do with all that? Now, let's take a look at the Old Testament. I'll just give you a couple examples. It'll probably, I hope, you know, sort of unravel the, the complexity here. You have names like Malkiel in the Old Testament, Genesis 46, 7, uh, 17. That can be translated, my king, Malki, that's Hebrew for my king, is El. You know, El is a deity name. You could, you know, you could also spell it 
or have a variety of derivative, something similar as Malkiah. Okay, we have Ezra 10.31, Jeremiah 38.6. That would be my king is Yahweh or Yah. We also have names like Yehod Sadak or Yod Sadak. That would be the first part of the name, Yeho or Yo. Again, in Hebrew, I, I can't explain why Yo is still a divine name in, in a podcast, but either of those would mean Yahweh is righteous. Haggai 1.1, 1, 1, Ezra 3.2, you get those examples. And if you're paying attention, you might think, well, couldn't it also mean Yahweh is Tzedek? Yeah, it could. Uh, again, so what in the world are these people in the Old Testament? What, what are they thinking when they take these names? Were they, were they names given at birth? Or are they titles later? Are, do they make theological statements? Are they titles that just sort of telegraph some belief that the person has? And we, and we don't really get the, the true name of the person. You know, what's going on here? And again, all these things are possible with Melchizedek. It could be my king you know, is righteous. My king is Sedek. It could be king of righteousness. It could be something like Malk is righteous or Malk is Sedek. It, it, it could be any of those five things just in, in this one little name. Uh, another example from the book of Joshua, Joshua 10.1, Joshua 10.3, the, the closest example is Adonai Sedek. In Hebrew, it would be Adoni, my Lord, and then Tzedek. Tzedek is my Lord, or my Lord is Tzedek. Now, this particular guy in the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 and verse 3, is the king of Jerusalem at the time of Joshua, okay, which at the time of Joshua is a Canaanite city. And Tzedek, again, as we're going to see a bit, a bit later, is a, is a, a well-known Canaanite deity. So it makes sense for the king of Jerusalem at that particular time. Remember, Jerusalem is only going to become the capital of Israel when David conquers it. You know, we're not even near David's time yet. Originally, it was this Canaanite city. And so here you have a king that, again, is this really his name? Is this his name his mom and dad gave him, or is it a title? But either way, we know him as Adoni, my lord, is Tzedek, which would make a lot of sense given in context. Well, if it makes sense for him in the days of Joshua, why wouldn't it make sense in the days of Abram, Abraham, to have Melchizedek mean my king is Tzedek, Malki Tzedek? Again, the, taking on this, this name of, the, of a Canaanite deity, because he's a Canaanite, and he's not an Israelite. Now, I, I realize, you know, when you get into this discussion, you know, you, you, you look at this and you go, well, that makes me a little uncomfortable because, you know, in Genesis 14, this guy is supposed to be priest of the Most High God, and if his king is Sedek, you know, Sedek, then how in the world does that work? You know, what what happened to El Elyon, God Most High, you know, the God of Israel? Who's who's this Sedek guy? Again, these are difficult questions, and in today's episode, we're we're, we're going to have to get into the, those things, but we're we're still you know, at, the, at the name. So I'm not, I'm not done with that yet because there's a lot there are other things to consider here in relationship to what we've already said. Now, as far as, again, Adonai Zedek, okay, just so that you fix it in your mind, because we're going to come back to this uh, more than once, we have in him sort of a, a, you know, what some scholars would say is kind of a template example, a, a, a very convenient parallel. My Lord is Zedek. He's in Jerusalem. That's in the land of Canaan proper. It's, it, you know, it, it's Canaanite territory. Uh, again, Joshua's in there to conquer things, but, you know, he, he doesn't actually conquer Jerusalem because Jerusalem, by the time of David, is still not in Israelite control. David is the one who has to, to conquer it. So we could have a thoroughly Canaanite context for certainly Adonai Zedek and very likely Melchizedek. So if we presume Melchizedek is a proper personal name. You know, it, it's probably theophoric. It's probably my king is Tzedek. Now, that we can't say that conclusively. It might be descriptive. Um, it might be my king is righteous, and then, you know, referring to some unknown king that Melchizedek was, a, you know, beholden to. We, we just don't know. But if we look at, at Adonai Zedek as, a, as this sort of, you know, really convenient example, a lot of scholars are sort, are sort of steered into the direction because of Adonai Zedek and Joshua 10. They're steered toward the notion that Melchizedek 
and in Hebrew, Malki Tzedek, is a theophoric personal name um, that this guy, again, is either given a name that honors the god Tzedek by his parents, or he takes it himself, and then it would also function as a title. Now, in the dictionary of IVP's dictionary of the Pentateuch, dictionary of the Old Testament, the, the Pentateuch volume, uh, S.J. Andrews notes the following uh, in this regard. So this is a, a short section from his entry on Melchizedek in the Pentateuch volume. He says, Melchizedek and Adonai Zedek may have been Canaanite royal epithets. So he's going to try to defend the epithet view that, that this is not necessarily a personal theophoric name. So here, here's the other side. E.A. Spicer has argued that Melchizedek is just the Canaanite equivalent of the Mesopotamian title Shar Mesharim, which means the just king or the righteous king. This would suggest that Melchizedek is a royal title rather than a personal name. The use of MLK and then Tzedek as a descriptive title is actually attested a few times in the Northwest Semitic world. A 14th century BC letter addressed to the king of Egypt discovered at Ras Ibn Hani, that's, a, that's a, going to be an Ugaritic context, contains several royal epithets applied to the pharaoh. Included in this salut salutatory list are such titles as MLK, that's the word for king, again in Semitic, ML king and then RB, Rab, the great king, and MLK. Mitzrayim, king of Egypt, as well as the phrase MLK Tzedek, the just king. So that, again, to just to interrupt uh, Andrews' you know, little, little essay here, that's precedent, again, for taking this as a descriptive epithet, the, the just king. So here you have this guy come out to meet Abram. He's a priest of the Most High God, and his name happens to be Malki Tzedek, and it just means his name, his title is the the just king or my king is just so it, it could refer to some guy we don't even know rather than a deity that's possible but again based on the analogy of adonai tzedek most scholars dra gravitate toward the theophoric name option but but you got you got this this is a legitimate possibility even though it might be a minority view back to uh andrews he writes the 10th century bc inscription of yechimilk king of Byblos, claims that he is MLK Tzedek, and then the conjunction and MLK Yashar, so that he is a just and upright king. So there you get the MLK Tzedek in that inscription from Byblos. Later in the 5th century BC, the inscription of Yechalmilk, also king of Byblos, contains the phrase, for he is a just king, a MLK Tzedek just king. That's the end of uh, Andrew's entry. So I think he marshals a, a decent amount of evidence there that the elements of Melchizedek's name might be a royal title, might be an epithet, might be some descriptive phrase about some guy that we don't even know who it is, because it wouldn't be the guy standing in front of Abram. So he's a priest of the Most High God, and his name, again, would, would be honorifically given to him to honor his king, whoever that is. Or it could be a theophoric name, my king. You know, the guy who's standing in front of Abraham, his name is a, is a theological statement. My king is the deity, Tzedek. Those are your two major options. Again, Hebrews 7, 2, king of righteousness. You can sort of get there from my king is just or my king is righteous. You know, it, it, it's just a little... Not, not a play on words, but it's just another way of saying the same thing. So the New Testament you know, rendering of this isn't inaccurate. It just doesn't inform us about what the other options are. Now, let's go to, again, the way that this is described, because now we have a, another element here that might, again, make us gravitate away from one option and toward another. Genesis 14, 18 actually does describe Melchizedek as a king. He is the Melech Shalem, the king of Salem, king of Shalem. Okay, so if he's the king of Shalem and his name is Malki Tzedek, it's kind of weird because 
the guy standing in front of Abraham is a king. He's the king of Shalom. But his name, does his name mean my king is righteous? Well, if he's the king, who, who would his king be? Again, this is another reason why, even though this idea of my king is righteous, that, that it could be an epithet that refers to some other person, even though that's possible, it just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense if Melchizedek himself is a king, because then he'd have another king who's referred to as right. It just, it makes more sense to have Melchizedek as a priest of the Most High God and a king of Shalom. And his name means my king is Tzedek. In other words, it's a theological statement. It's a theophoric name. This is why most scholars gravitate toward that view. Not only is it possible, not only does it have a good precedent in the Old Testament and in lots of other Semitic languages as well, which we didn't get into, but it also seems to make better contextual sense rather than the alternative. So let's talk about King of Solomon, King of Shalom. You know, S and SH are kind of interchangeable here in, in Semitic, at least at this stage. We have here this description Melchizedek is the King of Solomon. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to say Salem since that's such an anglicized pronunciation here, but Solom. Psalm 76.2. That in the Masoretic text, that would actually be verse 3. So if you're looking in Hebrew, you need to know that. So in English, English Bible, Psalm 76.2 places Solom in parallel with Zion. Let me just read you the verse. His abode has been established in Solom, his dwelling place in Zion. And again, if we actually click out to that verse... His abode, well, the, the prior verse is, in Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. So the, the, the hymn there, you know, his abode, being referred to as obviously the, the God of Israel. So Psalm 76.2 places Solomon in parallel with Zion, suggesting that Solomon is to be identified as Jerusalem. And you say, well, duh, you know, isn't that obvious? Well, actually, it's not, because you have, you have some other things going on here. This identification is affirmed in the Targums, which are late. The Dead Sea Scrolls, again, which are uh, also later than, you know, the Old Testament, it's, that's intertestamental material, also in Josephus and early rabbinic and Christian literature. They all, again, say that Solomon is Jerusalem, it's Zion, you know, six one half dozen of another. Now, in the Amarna tablets, Jerusalem is spelled Uru Salim, possibly reflecting a combination of the Sumerian word for city, Uru and the name Solom. Now, in 397 AD, Jerome, again, the famous person, famous translator who gave us the Latin Vulgate, Jerome rejected the view that Jerusalem was Solom. Of course, this is going to be, since it's Jerome, it's going to filter down into, into church tradition. He argued that the Genesis 14.18 referred to Salim, a town located in Samaria, northeast of modern Nablus. It is also noteworthy that Hebrews 7.2 appears to interpret MLK, okay, the king of Shalom or Solom, as a title. It doesn't, it doesn't interpret it geographically because in Hebrews 7.2, 7, we have the phrase king of peace. It doesn't say king of Jerusalem. It doesn't say king of Uru Shalom. It doesn't say king of Zion. It, it says king of peace. So here we have another problem. So not only do we have a problem with the name, and again, you know, Hebrews 7, 2 can be in the ballpark. It, 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 saying that Melchizedek's main name means king of righteousness is linguistically possible. It's, it's unlikely that's what's going on in the Old Testament story originally, because Melchizedek is himself a king. And again, because of that, we, we sort of lean over, at least I do, we, we lean over to the theophoric name option. My king is Tzedek. So the writer of Hebrews doesn't get this wrong. He is taking one possible trajectory and sort of playing on it. And he does the same thing with this king of Solom phrase, because he doesn't interpret it as king of a geographical spot, king of a particular city. He actually you know, takes that phrase and, and translates it, renders it as king of peace. So we have both connection points in the book of Hebrews back to 
Genesis 14, obviously, because they're talking about Melchizedek. But we also have points of disconnect. You know, we, we have a, a, a sort of intentional use of these phrases by the writer of Hebrews, again, to make a certain theological point. I don't want to drift into the New Testament too much, but I want you to see that when we get to the New Testament, we're going to have to come back to, you know, this, this issue. Again, the, the name itself and this descriptive phrase, King of Solomon, aren't really precisely reproduced in the book of Hebrews the way people in the time of Abraham or in, you know, in, in the biblical period when it comes to Israelite stuff. They probably would have read it differently than the writer of Hebrews does in chapter 7 of that book. Again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's talk about more on the solemn Jerusalem connection. Um, I'm going to quote now from Anchor Bible Dictionary um, at length here, Philip King's entry on Jerusalem, because it's kind of interesting. It gives you, again, some of the backdrop here to the term. He writes, a long history lies behind Jerusalem. It was the name of the city from early times. Jerusalem is mentioned for the first time in the Egyptian execration texts, which are 19th to the 18th centuries BCE, where the form of the name is probably to be read as Rushalimu. The name appears again in diplomatic correspondence, this time as Urushalim in Akkadian in the Amarna letters, 14th century BC. Abdi Chiba, a vassal of Egypt who was reigning in Jerusalem at the time, sent letters to the Egyptian pharaoh, Amenophis or Amenhotep uh, IV, who was Akhenaten, affirming his loyalty again to the pharaoh. Later Assyrian texts also refer to Jerusalem. For example, in the records of Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem in 701 BC, the form Ur Salimu or other variant spellings appears. The name Jerusalem, Hebrew Yerushalayim, is of uncertain etymology. Although it is apparently of West Semitic, i.e. Canaanite origin, it appears to be composed of two elements. Yeru, Y-R-W, which means to establish, and Shalom, S-H-L-M, the name of the West Semitic god, deity, Shalem. Okay, so here we, here we run into another deity name. Shalem is a deity in Canaanite religion. We keep running into Canaanite deities here, don't we? We have Malk, we have Tzedek, and now we've got Shalem. Again, that shouldn't disturb you because look at the context. It's con we have Abraham; he's in Canaan. We don't have, you know, you know, we don't have the conquest yet. We don't, we don't have anything. It's Abraham, okay? We, we don't have any of this territory under the dominion uh, of, of Yahweh, the God of Israel. We have Canaanite location, and you would expect Canaanite names. And if people are naming things in Canaan, they're going to be naming things after deities because hey, that's what you do. It's it's honorific. So we have here, again, it could mean Yeru to establish and then Shalom or Shalem, the name of the West Semitic god Shalem, patron of the city. The meaning, continuing now with ABD, the meaning may be foundation of Shalom. In other words, foundation of the god, the deity, Shalom, mentioned in a mythological text from Ugarit. Genesis 14.18 refers to Melchizedek as king of Solom or Shalom, likely Jerusalem. If so, this shortened form is the first biblical allusion to Jerusalem. In other words, if it really is Jerusalem, this is the first time it's mentioned. In Psalm 76.3, Solom, Shalom, is used in synonymous parallelism to Zion, referring to the divine dwelling. Joshua 10.4 contains the first specific biblical reference to Jerusalem, whose inhabitants were Canaanites. Again, in the days of Joshua, there it relates to Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, who formed a coalition with neighboring kings and attacked Gibeon. Joshua defeated them, but Jerusalem was not taken. According to Judges 1.8, the Judahites captured Jerusalem and destroyed it by fire. The text is historically, uh, <laughs> let's put it this way, you know, the, the writer here, Philip King, says the text is historically unreliable. He, he doesn't take this as a, as a historical statement. Because, he continues, Jerusalem was not conquered until the time of David. Well, let me just editorialize here. You can burn the city and not occupy it. Okay? It's, it's not real complicated. Back to the selection. Some Old Testament texts, 
Joshua 15.8, 18.28, Judges 19.10, so on, equate Jebus, J-E-B-U-S, the name derived from the pre-Israelite inhabitants of Jerusalem, with Jerusalem. Well, how can you, again, this is me now interrupting. Wait a minute. I, how can you have Uru Shalem and have this be Jerusalem? And, and, and who's this? What's this Jebus? Okay, the, the Jebusites, original inhabitants of, of Jerusalem. So how, how does this term fit in with these other ones? Well, King continues. He says, Jebus is the name derived from the pre-Israelite inhabitants of Jerusalem, conveys the impression that Jebus, Hebrew Yavus, was the pre-Davidic name for ancient Jerusalem. The city was never actually called Jebus, though it had been a Jebusite settlement. The Amarna tablets attest that Jerusalem, not Jebus, was the name of the city. Nor does Jebus appear in other ancient Near Eastern texts, whereas and we just read a bunch of examples. Uru Shalem, Jerusalem, actually does show up in, in ancient texts. Despite the lack of extra-biblical evidence, King says some would argue that Jebus and Jerusalem designate the same city. Others suggest that Jebus may be identified with Shaphat, situated slightly north of Jerusalem. So that's the end of, of King's uh, entry. Now, Stephen Reed, also in the same publication, Anchor Bible Dictionary, in his entry on Jebus, says this, Some scholars have been troubled by this identification of Jebus in Jerusalem for several reasons. First, this identification is found in each case in a parenthetical note, which could be a later redactional, that is editorial, or scribal addition to the text. Second, while the name Jerusalem occurs in the 14th century El Amarna texts and in the 19th, 18th century BC execration texts, no reference is ever made to Jebus. Third, Jerusalem seems to be too far south to be located on the southern border of Benjamin. While the Jebusites inhabited and controlled Jerusalem, this does not necessarily mean that Jebus was Jerusalem. Miller contends that the later scribes misidentified Jebus with Jerusalem on the basis of the Jebusite control of the city and suggests that Jebus should actually be located at present-day Shaphat. If Jebus was actually used as a name for Jerusalem, it must have been a temporary name and must have existed alongside the older name, Jerusalem. So I read those two selections again to alert you to the fact and to alert listeners to the fact that, you know, we're well aware here of the Jebus Jerusalem issue. Uh, we're well aware of the Uru Shalom, you know, the, the, really the, the focus on the Jerusalem name and other ancient Near Eastern texts. Um, so we're not, we're not skipping any of, the, any of the thorny details here on the podcast. We don't do that. But what it really comes down to is most likely, again, because, not because of, of the Bible or because, you know, we have something to defend here. It is most likely that Jerusalem, Uru Shalom, is the original name and, and, and the only name actually of the city. And Jebus could have been something, you know, very close to, you know, adjacent to it. And the people of that area moved into the city, took control of it for a while, and that's where the association came from. So back to Melchizedek, I mean, you've got him as king of Shalom, king of Salem. And that, and that would make sense, okay, that, that would be historically accurate because of what we just read. Back in the days of, of Abram, this place would have been known not as Jebus. It would have been known as Uru Shalom, you know, the city of Shalom or the foundation of Shalom. And again, Shalom is a Canaanite deity. So what do we have to, to this point? Let's just summarize a few things. We have somebody named Malkitzedek in Genesis 14. He's both a king and a priest. So his name is probably Theophoric. My king is Tzedek. Okay. Because we, you know, my king is righteous as a title, that would make this king, Melchizedek, referring to some other king, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We have a king priest then of a Canaanite city. The city is Solomon, Shalom, Jerusalem, in, in, you know, for all practical purposes here, in pre-Davidic days, prior to the Israelite occupation under, you know, King David. We have a Canaanite orientation, therefore, and that makes sense in light of Joshua 10 and Adonai Tzedek being the king there. Okay, a little bit later, we still have this place under Canaanite control. That makes good sense. You know, historically, it's clearly a Canaanite name. And it's arguable that the name of the king of this same place, remember Adonai Tzedek is the king of Jerusalem, and Melchizedek, you know, a few hundred years, whatever, you know, prior to him, 
was king of Solom. So he would have been king of the city. And then Adonizedek is the king of the same city. And Adonizedek's name is my lord is Tzedek. So again, we take that back to Genesis 14. It makes sense to have Melchizedek's name mean my king is Tzedek. Or Adonizedek is my lord is Tzedek, excuse me. So you have, you have two guys, likely king over the same place at different time periods. And both of their names have this Tzedek element in it. And it's a Canaanite context. So that's what we have to this point. All right, that concludes part 1A. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 167, Melchizedek, part 1B. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Looking forward to getting back into Melchizedek. All right, it sounds good. All right, Mike, well, I'm ready for the second half of Melchizedek in the Old Testament. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get into that. So who in the world is Tzedek? It's time to, you know, to focus on who's this deity? Why do we have this deity name here? Why do we have a, you know, what looks like a foreign deity name associated with this guy whom Abraham is talking you know, with, who's blessing Abraham in the name of the Most High God? Because that kind of suggests that Tzedek is the Most High God, not Yahweh. See, that, that's, that's the issue here for you know, a number of scholars, a number of readers. So that, that's where we have to focus. Now, I'm going to read extensively from Bernard Bato, uh, his article on Tzedek in Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's very good. Again, this is going to be an extensive quotation. And he goes you know, through you know, the, the material. Then I'll make some comments, you know, typically like I do as we go. And then also afterwards. So here's Bato, again, a, a lengthy excerpt from DDD. He writes, The West Semitic deity, Zedek or Tzedek, righteousness, is found in the Bible only in personal names. Malki Tzedek, Genesis 14, Psalm 110, uh, and again, the book of Hebrews, obviously. And secondarily, Adonai Tzedek, Joshua 10, 1 and 3. Both of them are Canaanite kings of pre-Israelite Jerusalem. Tzedek is probably to be identified with the deity known as Ishar among the Amorites and Kitu in Babylonian, and thus a hypostasis or personification of the god Shamash's function as a divine overseer of justice. Now that, that's, that, that's two sentences in, and we've already got you know, things to unravel. So this is, this is Mike now. Basically, you have a deity that went by different names among different people groups. And among those different people groups, those, the names that they used were indicative of the sun gods, Shamash. That, that's, that's a Semitic word for sun. Of Shamash's role as divine overseer of justice. Now, if, think about it this way. Just, just think about what I just said. If you have the sun god for some Canaanites being the god of justice, well, doesn't justice isn't the Canaanite word for that Sedek? Well, yeah, it is. You know, so you could you could refer to the different role of of the deity by different terms, and this is how you get this sort of like round robin of terminology in ancient Near Eastern deities. You, you, this happens all the time, where different people groups would refer to a deity by different names, but assign to him the same properties. And, the, and it, it creates confusion for us because of the different names. So that, that's what you have going on here. Back to Bato. The cult of Tzedek appears to have been well established in pre-Israelite Jebusite Jerusalem. Some aspects of this cult apparently were translated into Yahwism, worship of Yahweh. In a number of texts, righteousness with a capital R appears either as a member of Yahweh's court, his council, or as a personification of Yahweh's concern for justice, kind of like Yahweh himself. Evidence for the West Semitic deity Tzedek is mostly indirect, but nonetheless compelling. Most decisive is a statement by Philo of Byblos that the Phoenicians had a god named Tzedek, or in other words, Tzedek. Philo, who claimed to get his information from the Phoenician writer Sankunyat, uh, I always mess this name up, Sankunyaton, noted that the Phoenicians numbered among their gods, quote, Misor and Sidik. Misor and Sidik correspond to Hebrew Mishor, which means justice, and Sedek, which means righteousness. 
Tzedek is not directly attested elsewhere as the name of a deity, but indirect evidence comes from two sources, the Amorite and Babylonian pantheon, and of course, West Semitic personal names. The West Semitic god Tzedek seemingly corresponds to the deity known as Kitu in the Babylonian pantheon and as Ishar in the Amorite pantheon. In Mesopotamia, the preservation of truth and justice was considered to be the particular domain of the sun god Shamash. Truth and truth, capital T, or right, capital R, was personified and deified as the god Kitu, which means truth or right, from the Akkadian root Kanu and the Hebrew root Kon. Kitu was often invoked together with the god Misharu, justice. One or both of these deities were described as seated before Shamash. In other words, they were Shamash's attendant or ministers of Shamash's right hand. It appears that the deity known as Kitu in Babylonia was known further to the west under the names Ishar and Tzidku, Tzedek, all three names having essentially the same meaning, but operative in different linguistic communities. West Semitic personal names contain the root Containing the root Tzedek are attested at many sites, including Elamarna, Ugart, Rima, and Mari. In the Bible, the god Tzedek appears only in the personal names of two Canaanite kings. Again, we, this is familiar territory, Melchizedek and Adonizedek, fueling speculation that Jerusalem was a cult center for Tzedek in pre-Israelite times. Melchizedek is identified not only as king of Salem, but also a priest of God Most High. Today, usually understood to mean that Melchizedek was a devotee of the god El, head of the Canaanite pantheon. Others argue, though, that Melchizedek was a priest of the god Sedek. Again, that, and I'll just stop there for a moment. That's understandable because of what we've you know, talked about before. His, his name might be, you know, my king is Sedek. Back to Bado. One hypothesis suggests that Sedek is to be identified with the god Shalom, whose name is embodied in Jerusalem. Support for this hypothesis may come from the Ugaritic personal name Tzedek Shalom. There's an Ugaritic personal name that actually combines the two. Okay, that's me talking now. So support for the hypothesis may come from the Ugaritic personal name Tzedek Shalom. Should this name mean Tzedek is Shalom rather than the more probable Shalom is righteous? Shalom certainly has connections with a solar cult, aspects of which may have been incorporated into Israelite Yahwistic religion. A long-standing cult of Tzedek at Jerusalem could account, at least partially, for the fact that even during the Israelite period, Jerusalem laid special claim to such titles as the city of righteousness, city of Tzedek. That's Isaiah. So it's much later, Isaiah 121 and also 126. Jerusalem is called the city of Tzedek, city of Tzedekah, righteousness. And pasture of righteousness, that's Jeremiah 31:23. Pasture of Tzedek, Tzedekah, righteousness. Although evidence of a solar cult in the Temple of Jerusalem has been exaggerated in the past by some scholars, nevertheless, some form of a solar cult was practiced in the Temple in Jerusalem right up to the time when the Temple was destroyed in the 6th century BC. That's Ezekiel 8.16. And in our series in Ezekiel, we talked about that when we hit chapter 8 about people worshiping Yahweh as, as a sun deity. And again, you can see how they could do that we talked about that then, but, you know, God wasn't real happy with it because you're not supposed to worship, you know, the objects and the, and the celestial objects in the sky. So we, you know, that's familiar territory, at least to, to long-term podcast listeners here. Back to Bado. It is unclear that this solar cult is traceable back to Jebusite times, however. It may be that Manasseh introduced this ritual only a century earlier under Assyrian influence. Josiah's reforms circa 620 BC, during which Quote, the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord, unquote, were removed. And, quote, the chariots of the sun, unquote, were burned. That's 2 Kings 23, 11. Uh, again, this could indicate that these things, you know, the, the, these, these reforms of Josiah were in part aimed at destroying the symbols of Assyrian hegemony over Judah, namely these, these sun worship symbols. Aspects of the West Semitic god Sedek were absorbed into Yahwism uh, at some point. Rather than remaining as an independent deity, Sedek, righteousness, was translated as a quality of Yahweh. Thus, at times, Sedek and Yahweh are found in synonymous parallelism. And that's an important thought because for the biblical writers, 
when when think of it this way, when Jerusalem is taken over by David, okay, and 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 obviously, think about well, you know, just think about biblical history, okay. So here you got Abraham. Let's just go all the way back there. Abraham worships Yahweh. It's just Abraham, okay, and he has he has some kids. He's got some servants. I mean, those are the Yahweh worshippers around. They're living in in, in Canaan because God told him to go there. Everybody else is a Canaanite, so of course you're going to run into people who are Canaanites, and they're going to be you know. People like this Melchizedek guy, you know, who is a priest of the Most High God, and at 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 the time, you know, just just think about what what we have to deal with here. Could we say that Melchizedek at the time considered the Most High God Sedek? In other words, that was his name for the Most High God. When, when if you walked up to Melchizedek and said, "Hey, who's the Most High God?" He would say Sedek. All right. So that doesn't mean that it's a different deity than Yahweh necessarily, okay? It means that we have a different name for the same deity. Again, it, it can go either way, and, and scholars are divided. What we know for sure, though, what we know for sure is that by the time you get David come in there, take control of the city, there's no ambiguity as to who David's worshiping. And when the, the historical books, again, get written, they're going to reflect a theological revolution. That no, we're not going to we're not going to come into this place called Jerusalem, and okay, we're coming in here as Yah- Yahweh worshippers, and yeah, you guys are doing your tzedek thing over here. No, we're here to tell you that the Most High God is Yahweh, and and you have this sort of textual merging that reflects this this sort of uh, how, what's what's the term I'm looking for, kind of a a, a theological statement. I don't want to say theological takeover, but but that might be a, a good way to put it. David goes in there and says, we are claiming this turf because this was given to our, our ancestors by Yahweh, the Most High God. We are claiming this turf, this city. This is going to be my capital. Capital, I am the one chosen you know, by, by God to be king. And this is going to be his place. And we're not messing around with all these other deity names. They are, if there's talk of the Most High going on here, if, you know, we're not going to use the term Tzedek. We're going to use the term Yahweh because he is the most high. So it, it's difficult for us looking at this, you know, to think you know, how, how this sort of, how this system kind of worked. You know, again, maybe this is a poor analogy, but think about the way we, we refer to God. We refer to God as God, as Yahweh, as El, as El Shaddai, as Father. I mean, if, we, if we really sat down and thought about it, we probably got 10 or 15 ways that we refer to God. And and we don't theologically have any other deity above him, but yet we use all these different names. And what if what if we were doing that in a in a in a historical context where some of the people who heard us use these names thought we were referring to other deities? That's the kind of thing you have going on in in biblical times. It's really confusing to know Who's thinking what about a single deity or more than one deity at any given time? And so what the biblical writers try to do is they try to consolidate. They, they're, they're making theological statements. You know, they have to include, you know, some of these other names because they're just parts of history. They, they're, they're historical events. They're, they're historical, you know, deities. This is you know, the way things were. But, but the biblical writers make an effort to make a theological statement and sort of merge all of these things into Yahweh or or they 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 take these other names and they align them with Yahweh as the most high god and and when you do that and when you codify it when you actually produce a a written document this thing we call the bible the or the old testament anyway that's the thing that that your your people are going to read and be taught from and so that act of codifying this theological thinking, this theological, how do, I, how do I want to say it? This theological statement, this theological corrective or clara, point of clarification, this theological clarification about who it is we're worshiping. When you do that and you codify it in a written document, again, the Old Testament, that is sort of at the forefront of a transition of theological thinking. So, you know, it, it's it's really hard to to say again, even with certain biblical characters, what they were thinking about any at any given point theologically, because all we have is a particular story about them. 
they might bear a name like Melchizedek. We, we, we don't we don't really know who he was he was thinking about or what he was thinking, but we do know what the biblical writers think. The biblical writer is going to make sure that names like Tzedek or El or El this and that, Shaddai, whatever. The biblical writers are going to make sure that their readers know that who we're talking about is the God who made a covenant with Israel. His covenantal name is Yahweh. He could go by these other names and did. And we, we have biblical evidence for that. Their, their agenda, and I'm using that in a good way, they're trying to teach theology by this strategy of subsuming all this other deity stuff, this, these deity language, you know, this deity language, these deity names, it, subsuming that into Yahweh of Israel, the covenant you know, name of, of, of the God who brought us out of Egypt and all that, that, that sort of thing. The Bible itself in its creation is a theology lesson. It's, it's, it's putting forth a theology. Now, let, let's go back to, to Bato, pick up where we left off. He says, again, rather than remaining as an independent deity, tzedek, righteousness, was translated as a quality of Yahweh. In other words, it's not a, biblical writers transform the name away from being a, a possibly understood as a separate deity, and they make it a quality of Yahweh. They, they bring it, they, they subsume it with Yahweh. They're going to do this with other deities like Dever and Ketev. They don't, you know, it, it, the, the Canaanites would think these are these are you know big big time deities. In certain past, this is just me now rabbit trailing. In certain passages, Dever and Ketev again are, are are depicted as servants of Yahweh. Again, that that's a theological statement, like Habakkuk three. They they follow in Yahweh's retinue, you know, um, Dever you know, and Ketev is you know plague, you know th this sort of plague language and disaster language. They serve Yahweh. They're subservient. They're lesser. They're part of, 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 of his own heavenly entourage. They do his bidding for him. Okay. And, and both those terms have to do with natural disasters. So that it's a theological statement. Deities, other deities are reduced to servants of the Most High, you know, who is Yahweh, or their attributes get absorbed into Yahweh as the Most High. This is the, the biblical writers do this all over the place because they are teaching theology. That's what they're doing. So again, back to Bato again, I'll try to get through this section. Rather than remaining as an independent deity, Tzedek righteousness was translated as a quality of Yahweh. Thus at, at times, Tzedek and Yahweh are found in synonymous parallelism. Here's some examples. Hearken to me, you who pursue righteousness, Tzedek, you who seek Yahweh. It's Isaiah 51.1. They're used in tandem there. Another example, they will be called the oaks of righteousness, Tzedek, the planting of Yahweh, Isaiah 61.3, Tzedek and Yahweh used in parallel. Psalm 4.6, sacrifice sacrifices of righteousness and trust in Yahweh. At other times, Bato continues, righteousness, in capital R, seems to be used as a part of a compound name, Yahweh, righteousness. That is in Psalm 17. Verse 1, you, know, you, you have, ESV has, hear a just cause, O Lord. And in Hebrew, you could actually translate that, hear, O Tzedek, Yahweh. You could, you could combine those names there, attend to my cry. Sometimes, Bato continues, it's also used as a substitute for Yahweh, for unto righteousness, unto Tzedek, will judgment return. That's Psalm 94.15. In some instances, righteousness, tzedek, appears as a hypostasis of the divine sovereign's invincible right arm, by which he rules the world and protects his devotees. Psalm 48.11. Righteousness, tzedek, fills thy, in other words, Yahweh's right hand, fills Yahweh's right hand. Uh, Isaiah 41.10. I, Yahweh, will support you with my right hand of tzedek, my right hand of righteousness. Isaiah 51, 5, my, Yahweh's righteousness, is near. My salvation has gone forth, and my arms will rule the peoples. In Psalm 118, the two typologies are joined after a reference to vindication through the, quote, right hand of Yahweh, unquote. In verses 15 and 16, the psalmist prays in verses 19 and 20, open for me the gates of righteousness, Tzedek. I will enter them, praising Yah, praising Yahweh. 
This is the gate to Yahweh through which the righteous enter. Poetic parallelism here allows no doubt that the gates of righteousness is the semantic equivalent of the gate to Yahweh. Yahweh is Tzedek, the defender of righteous persons. Jeremiah 33, 16 also played on this theme, declaring that in the end time, Jerusalem will be known by the name Yahweh is our righteousness. Yahweh is our tzedek. Now, one more section from Bato here. Tzedek and Mishor. Again, remember those you know, righteousness and justice is what those terms mean. Tzedek and Mishor were attendant deities of Shamash. They also have their reflexes in Yahweh worship as dual qualities of the God of Israel. Isaiah 11.4 says that the spirit of Yahweh will possess the messianic king with the result that, quote, he will judge the weak with righteousness and defend the poor of the earth with justice. He will judge the earth with Sedek and defend the poor of the earth with Mishor. That's at Psalm 45, 7 and 8. Other passages substitute the plural Mesharim for Mishor as the parallel word to Sedek, but the concept is the same. Example, Psalm 9, 9. He judges the world with righteousness, Tzedek. He judges the peoples with justice, and Mishorim. Psalm 58, 2 contrasts the righteous rule of Yahweh with the chaotic rule of the false gods. Quote, do you truly, O gods, speak righteousness, Tzedek? Do you judge humans with justice, Mishor, Mishorim? Psalm 98, 9. Uh, in Psalm 98, 9, even the normally rebellious waters of chaos acknowledge the kingship of Yahweh. Quote, he will judge the world with righteousness, Tzedek, and the peoples with justice, Mishor. In Isaiah 45, 19, Yahweh derides the gods of the other nations and proclaims that he alone is capable of salvation. I am Yahweh, who declares righteousness, Tzedek, who announces justice, Mishor, unquote. That's the end of Bado's entry, at least what I'm going to use from it. So you see what the biblical writers are doing. You know, what, what, where does all this leave us? Biblical writers polemically associated Yahweh and Sedek. They, they, they merged them. They combined them. They are teaching theology. Consequently, Melchizedek could bear the name of Yahweh or Sedek and not violate the theological proposition that, you know, Yahweh or Sedek, because in, 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 in the final form of the biblical text, they're, they're, they're one and the same, okay? He could bear the name Tzedek and, and refer to him as Most High because Tzedek was Yahweh. Okay? It's not a problem. You know, in its historical setting, again, do, do we really know that, that Melchizedek comes out to meet Abraham and, and he's, hey, hi, I'm Melchizedek. My, I, I, my name is my king is Tzedek. And I really know that that's your Yahweh. Is Melchizedek thinking that? Well, we don't have any way of knowing that. But again, let's stick with what we do know and what the biblical text shows us. What we do know and what the biblical writers do is they make it clear that, look, we got this plurality of names going on here, but it's Yahweh who is the Most High. And all of these other names are going to be subsumed into him because that is our theology. That is what we believe. That is the truth that we are putting forth, that Yahweh is King of Kings and God of Gods. And at one time, you know, we may not have cared what name you used. At one time, you know, we wouldn't have batted an eye because, you know, it's kind of like inside baseball. We all know what we're talking about here. But now that we're codifying this, we're writing this down for posterity. We want to make a theological statement. And that's what they do. That is what the biblical writers do everywhere. Now, I'll add just one thought. Again, this might be a little bit controversial, but hey, that's what we do here in the podcast. This whole proposition, this whole way of understanding this, again, to take all these names and sort of you know merge them and you know present a unified theology, you know that that's good news. That's theologically consistent. I, I think that's completely understandable. But guess what? That doesn't work very well with mosaic authorship. You know, it, it, how would we assume that Moses knew any of this, or or Moses strategically did this? Because Jerusalem hadn't been conquered. It's not conquered by Joshua's day. Okay, we, we still have a Canaanite, Adonai Tzedek, in Joshua's day, rule, you know, sitting as king over Jerusalem. So, you know, what we have here, again, I'm not saying, again, you, you, if you're listening to the podcast, you know my view. I'm, I'm what used to be called a supplementarian. 
I accept a mosaic core of what we call the Pentateuch. And then I, I, I think there was a lot of things added to it. And of course, you know, an, an editorial hand over all of it to, to produce the, the Torah in its final form. That makes a lot of sense. And it helps us to understand, you know, things like all this name merging and how different names, it, you know, plotted out at different points of biblical history is really talking about the same most high God. That's easy for us to understand in hindsight, but it, it, it's tough to, to assume it's tough to get there if you think Moses wrote every word of the, of the Torah, because there are just things going on in the text to produce this theology that Moses just didn't know. And, and Moses had no reason to even think about. So again, I'm just throwing that out there. I mean, here we are again, the, the simplistic view of, of mosaic authorship that I've talked about before on the blog or on the podcast. I understand it, but it gets in the way. Uh, of of clarity, it, it it gets in the way of of you know talking about what we actually find in the text in a in a coherent sort of way. Um, again, you know, it, to me, I, I I don't really care to parse out who wrote what when and all that kind of, kind of stuff. I'm just saying that to to sort of get there in a coherent you know presentation, you you've got to you've got to think about mosaic authorship. You've got to think about the authorship of the Torah a little bit differently uh, than we we typically do. And in practical terms, you know, I think. This is kind of evident at this point in the podcast as we move along here. Israelite religion is messy. Again, if you take a providential view of inspiration, which I have argued is the most defensible view and the most coherent view, then you have God prompting people all along the way to do good theology as they wrote and as they edited. The whole point of the enterprise was theological messaging. And if we believe there was a God behind it all, the God of the Bible, then the mission was accomplished. They did the job. So to summarize to this point, Melchizedek's name in my king is Tzedek or my king is righteous, you know, allowing for that possibility. His title, King of Solemn, associate him personally with kingship, Jerusalem, righteousness, peace, and priesthood. That's what we have in the Old Testament. And again, it doesn't matter if we have Tzedek as a theophoric name, because in, in biblical theology, in, in, the, in the big picture of biblical theology, Tzedek is Yahweh. That's what the biblical writers are presenting you know, in, in the bigger picture. So we, here we have this guy. Again, he's associated with the Most High God, Tzedek Yahweh. He's the king of, of Shalom, Salem, Jerusalem. We've got themes of righteousness going on, you know, and justice going on. We've got, a, we, he's also a priest. He's a king priest. He, you see what I'm doing here? There's a profile now building that people in the second temple period are going to use. They're going to talk about what, what's the meaning of this character. You know, what he gets picked up later in Psalm 110, uh, again, associated with messianic kingship. They begin to talk about Messiah along the lines of these themes that derive from the name and from, you know, the, 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 the historical setting in Jerusalem. I'll say secondly, at no point in all of this, is there any sense that this man, Melchizedek, was a divine being? Now, I know that, that that's popular with a lot of Christians, you know, because of the, of the New Testament phrase about Melchizedek in Hebrews without beginning or end. We'll get to that. What I'm telling you is you can't get a divine being out of any of this. And so my predilection is to is to to view Melchizedek not as a divine being because I don't have anywhere to hang that hat on. Now, if Melchizedek is a type, a prototype, you know, we'll use that word. I might be more familiar in English. But if Melchizedek is a type of Christ, well, okay, you know, we, we get that. And, and Christ, you know, uh, as, as the second person of the Trinity is eternal, without beginning, without end, all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean Melchizedek has to match the analogy at every point. A type, again, is a prefigurement. It's not a one-to-one -one equivalent in all aspects. So I'm just saying. Uh, so let's turn now to the second Old Testament issue, Psalm 110. It's almost as gnarly, but we're not going to spend uh, as much time on it because we'll, we'll pick up with it later uh, when we get to Messianic stuff. Put in the form of, the, of a question. Why does Psalm 110 connect the dynastic line of David and hence the Messiah? with the priestly order of Melchizedek? The answer is going to be David's association with Abraham in terms of lineage, genealogy, and how the original Melchizedek material frames the account of Abraham eschatologically. Believe it or not, there's eschatology in the, in the book of Genesis, in the Torah. Uh, and and the, the specific link is 
the rule of the son of David, the rule of, of, of a descendant Yahweh produces over all the nations. That's the eschatological part. So in Psalm 110, we read this, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion, your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's the first four verses. And now it, Psalm 110 turns eschatological. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings, plural, on the day of his wrath, day of the Lord. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Now, again, there's lots of technical argumentation based on intertextuality throughout the Torah and with Melchizedek and Abraham and this psalm, you know, all these you know, points of linguistic connection. We can't really, it's not going to translate well to a podcast, but I'm going to pick a few out. Think about it this way. Ask yourself this question. Is it a coincidence? Okay. Is it a coincidence? Now, let, me, let me set it up this way. Here, we just read Psalm 110. We have this statement about, hey, messianic guy. Okay, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So the messianic king is going to have a scepter. He's going to rule in the midst of his enemies. He's sent forth from Zion. He's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then it turns to this day of the Lord language about the conquest of the nations. Now, is it a coincidence that talk about the Most High and the nations outside of Psalm 110? Okay that this language shows up in Genesis 14 with Melchizedek and Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. You know, when the nations, you know, when the Most High divide the nations, again, the, that Deuteronomy 32 worldview, here it is again. Melchizedek and Abram, Abraham, the priest of the Most High, Melchizedek blesses Abraham. He is the priest of the Most High who blesses Abraham, the one whose seed will be the linchpin to reclaiming and ruling over the disinherited nations. I think you, you can see that there are obvious theological connections here. When you talk about Melchizedek and Abraham, you're, you're also have, again, if you're tuned in to the theology, again, you're reading the Bible, you, you have the whole Bible, you have the whole Torah at least. Let's say you've read Deuteronomy 32, oh, that's just terrible. You know, God disinherited the nations. How's he going to get them back? You know, then, oh, Genesis 12, right after the Babel event, he calls Abraham. And, and he says to Abraham, it's through you, through your seed, that all the nations of the, of the earth will be blessed. You know, so Abraham has something to do with, with getting the nations back. And then when Abraham meets Melchizedek, well, it turns out Melchizedek is priest of El Yon, the Most High God. And, and, and Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, again, these connections are, are deliberate, and, and there's a lot more. If you go to Numbers, is, is it another coincidence that in the Balaam Oracle, Numbers 24, verses 16 through 18, Balaam seeks, quote, the knowledge of the Most High, unquote. And then he launches into an eschatological prophecy in Numbers 24 of how the seed of Abraham, that is Israel, of course the Messiah by extension, will defeat its enemies and possess their lands. Look at what Balaam says in verse 17. It's Numbers 24. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Who's the him? Who, who does Balaam see, but not now? Who does he behold, but he's not yet near? A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Ooh, that sounds like Psalm 110. Yeah, it does. Again, it's not a coincidence. This star shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. And then if you keep going in verse 18, guess who else gets conquered? Edom and Seir. Remember our episodes on Obadiah? Remember our series on the podcast on Obadiah and how Edom, Seir, how these places were emblematic of Babylon? Babylon, Babylon. Where have I heard that before? Oh, yeah, Deuteronomy 32. That Babel was the place where the nations were disinherited. 
Does scepter rise out of Israel sound familiar from Numbers 24, 17? And of course, you get that language in Psalm 1, 110 in verse, verse 2. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Where does the scepter rise out of Israel? What, what's the other passage? It's Genesis 49, 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, the nations. Did you ever look at, for the context of Genesis 49? If you go back to verse 1, the context is, quote, in days to come. In Hebrew, it's literally the last days. I look at Numbers 24, 14, back to Numbers, back to the Balaam oracle. Behold, I am going to my people. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the last days, in the latter days. There's something going on here between Genesis 49, Numbers 24, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 110, Genesis 14, Abraham and his seed, and Melchizedek. <laughs> All of these things are tied together. And and the context for tying them together is reclaiming the nations that were disinherited. Deuteronomy 32 worldview again. There's something going on here with, with, with this, this talk, and then, of course, it's situated in the last days, and the conquest of the nations, the defeat of Babel, the children of Abraham. Melchizedek gets thrown into the mix because the name Most High is intertwined in several of these passages, and the fate of the nations coming back to Yahweh is tied to all of them. So in Psalm 110, the Davidic king is described this way, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations. Last thing I want to, we want to talk about here is why the priest language? Why does the king need to be a priest? What about the priesthood of Aaron? I'm sure you've asked that question. The short answer is that the evidence in the text that Melchizedek's kingship, remember he was king of Jerusalem, no less. And again, is that a coincidence? You know, since it was David, remember David, the one who would produce the Messiah, the Messianic line. Is that a coincidence since it was David who conquered the city and made that, that same place? The place where Melchizedek was king, David made it his capital. Is that a coincidence? No. Melchizedek's kingship is connected to Abraham. It legitimizes the rule of Abraham's seed. Now think of it this way. Melchizedek was king of Jerusalem. David is going to be king of Jerusalem. Melchizedek was priest of the Most High. So by connecting Melchizedek to David by means of Jerusalem, it also connects both of them to David because David is a descendant of Abraham, and it legitimizes the rule of Abraham's seed, who is David. And of course, ultimately, will you could say the same thing about the seed that David produces. It's also a, a descendant of Abraham, and that's, that's the Messiah. It's Jesus. That's why we, another, you know, another one of the reasons why we have Jesus' genealogy, going back through both of these guys. It would seem reasonable to think that this original kingship Okay, the original kingship of Jerusalem doesn't go back to David, it goes back to Melchizedek. The original kingship of Jerusalem also entailed a priestly role. And the priestly role would not be inherited by the sons of Aaron. It would be inherited by the sons of, the descendants of Abraham. And it has chronological priority over the Aaronic priesthood. So the Aaronic priesthood split the the role between it, it gave Israel two leaders political leader was Moses priestly leader was was Aaron the argument that Aaron's priesthood catch this I, I mentioned this before in quite in Q and A about Melchizedek but but we got we have to bring it up again think about this this is kind of a radical thought there's a good argument to be made that Aaron's priesthood was a divine concession to the lack of faith on Moses' part in other words it was Plan B. The idea is that plan A would have been, made, would have been to, to make Moses both the political leader and the priestly leader. But Moses was weak and, had, and lacked faith, so God allowed Aaron to enter the picture. Now, if you read certain things in Exodus 3 and 4, it's kind of striking. 
uh, Exodus 3.18. Let's just start there. They will, listen, they will listen to your voice. This is God speaking to Moses. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Okay. Then you know, in Exodus 4.1, you, know, you have the statement, Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. I mean, God just told him you know, in Exodus 3.18, look, they're, they're, they're going to listen to your voice. And Moses says, no, they won't. And this happens all the way. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of this going on in, in Exodus 3 and 4, where Moses takes, literally, takes what God says and just says, no, I don't believe it. That's not going to happen. And again, you have a series of faithless statements on Moses' part. And God, being patient, you know, puts up with it to a certain point. But note the point at which God becomes angry. And what he does. This is Exodus 4. Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. (laughs) Moses comes back, verse 13. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> I mean, he just he just can't believe. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff, with which you shall do all the signs. That's the end of the the passage, verse 17. So it's at this point that Aaron's status is elevated to co-leader. And that'll be his status, again, that his status will be what leads to him becoming the high priest. Now, Again, this is the proposal, and it's not new with me. You know, scholars have talked about this a lot. This would mean that the Aaronic priesthood is at best a concession or an accommodation to Moses. At worst, it's a punishment. In other words, Moses is not allowed to approach the most holy place later on, but Aaron is. Moses apparently leaves for Egypt without Aaron. Exodus four twenty four through twenty seven. You know, in that, in that whole funky episode with Zipporah, where, where God's going to kill Moses, he. He apparently left for Egypt without Aaron and incurs, incurs God's wrath, at least you know, in part for that. There are other things going on there, as I blogged about. The episode also has something to do with Moses failing to circumcise his son. Okay, But you know, at the end of it, he links up with Aaron. You know, and, and it's like, okay, now we can go. So apparently, after all of this, Moses just disobeys or is just incompetent, and he leaves without Aaron. In Exodus 4.29, Moses and Aaron gather the elders, quote-unquote, precisely what God had told Moses to do alone in Exodus 3.16. Aaron also repeats signs that God originally told Moses to perform. Exodus 4.30, example, Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs. Aaron did the signs in the sight of the people. Aaron acts in the place of Moses at other times. In Frankly, in, in two chapters, Exodus 4 and 5, for example, and chapter 6. In Exodus 6, 12, Moses again does not believe the people will listen to him. He says it again. He doesn't believe the people will listen to him if he speaks God's words to them. So Aaron is brought on the scene in verse 13 to get the job done. In the rest of Exodus 6, we get the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. And then the next, and then, and then the text adds what feels like an explanation for why both genealogies are there. Here, here are the genealogies. This is verse 26, or at least the comment on the genealogies. So you have the genealogies, and then you run into verse 26, and it says this, Exodus 6. These are the Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord had said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt. This is Moses and this Aaron. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. 
But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? You know, the the writer here, you know, is this Moses? Here we are back to the Mosaic authorship here. But the writer here, right after giving the genealogy of both, basically explains, has to explain why Aaron's there. And he does. He does. So the leadership, you know, think about the, the flow of biblical history. The leadership up to this point, up to Moses, had been one guy, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You know, you can almost count Joseph, but you know, we'll just stick with the major, major patriarchs. Then he hit Moses. They're single leaders and single mediators. They're the, they're the go-betweens between themselves, you know, and, and the rest of the people, and, you know, between God and the rest of the people. And here with Moses, it splits. Aaron's priesthood is the result of Moses' unbelief at the, from the very beginning. It's a concession. And incidentally, doesn't that make the golden calf incident all the more tragic? Because that's Aaron's fault. Moses will eventually step up, but by then the Aaronic priesthood is in place. Now, presuming the Melchizedek priesthood is legitimate because it predates Aaron, and it goes back to Jerusalem, and it's linked to Abraham, whose seed will bring back the nations. Okay, assuming all that, presuming the Melchizedek priesthood is legitimate, it was the ideal. It was political leader and priesthood combined, just as was God's original pattern. Some very obvious connections to the apocalyptic Old Testament framework for Melchizedek again spring from this. Look at the, again, the passage. Go back to to, to the passage. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, It's kind of interesting because that means that the one who, (laughs) the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your your enemies your footstool. He's already reigning. He's already seated at the right hand, but not yet. He's not yet triumphant over the nations. Verse 2, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter rule in the midst of your enemies. Zion is Shalom. It's Jerusalem. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. So, you know, you, you have this sense even in Psalm 110 that a descendant of, of, of David blessed by Melchizedek is already reigning, but not yet. Okay, there's, there's this sense you know, that, that we have this already not yet thing going on. So again, to wrap this up, who is Melchizedek in Old Testament thought? We're, we're just focused here on Old Testament. We've, we've gone through a number of these things. You know, there are lots of issues here. As long as we've taken it, it it's still just touching touching the basics. You could drill down, you know, further on, on any number of these points. But we've got a situation here where we have, again, the these passages connected. We have these two individuals, Melchizedek and Abraham. Abraham, again, is connected to the nations because it's his seed that will bring them back. Melchizedek is connected to the fate of the nations because he is the priest of the Most High God. And it was the Most High God who divorced the nations in the first place back in the days of Babel. These themes are connected. They're, they're these, these, these textual links in and among all of these different passages. You, know, you, you had the Balaam language about the scepter, about the star that will rise. Okay, you know, he wants he's seeking the knowledge of the Most High. You know, all this stuff that we've been been through. You know, who, who is who is Melchizedek? Well, he is the prototype. Other than being a, a, a person. A, in history, in the, in the life of Abraham, he is the prototype for the human king priest. He's a human leader, but he also has a mediatorial role to all other humans and back to the nations. Again, this is a post fall story. So we have the restoration of human priest kingship ruling in God's stead. In other words, Melchizedek is kind of, yeah, he's the prototype for the king that will come, but he's also emblematic of what Adam was too the original king, steward, ruler in Edom, and he was the mediator between God and, and all the other humans that would be born from Adam and Eve, you know, from, from the union of, of Adam and his wife. So Melchizedek, again, is, is, is part of that template. And that template was consistent. You have one ruler, you have one figure that God is sort of using as a priest to the rest of his, his descendants, his family, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That extends, again, all the way up until Moses. When, when, when you hit Moses, you know, it, it bites the dust. Let's just put it that way. It, it fails. 
it fails because of Moses. God has to make a concession. But, but Melchizedek, again, is the template. And that's why he is referenced as the ideal. As, as If you're going to have the Messiah, and the Messiah is going to be the second Adam, and the Messiah is going to be a king and a priest, the only touch point you know, back to Adam is this guy, Melchizedek. You have to go there. You have to you have to validate the the combination of king and priest in the Messiah. You can't validate that with Moses and Aaron. You go. You have to. You have to go back to the original template. You have to go back to Melchizedek uh, again, who who blessed Abraham. And there you have the connection to to ruling the nations, bringing the nations back because the the Messiah just happens to be one of the seed of Abraham. So it's a it's a complex matrix of ideas. And you get these Melchizedek, you know, prophecies, you know, in Psalm 110 and elsewhere, showing that God planned a return to the priest king idea. And he connected his rule with the reclaiming of the nations, and that the priest king would be the seed of Abraham and later the seed of David. The conquest of Jerusalem by David shows God's intention, as the blessing of the priest king of the Most High in Abraham's own day, you know, showed God's intentions as well. Uh, you know, the descendant of Abraham would follow in the steps of Melchizedek. So again, it's complicated. It's a matrix of, of thoughts. And we're only in the Old Testament. Second Temple Jews are going to see all of these things that we just overviewed. They're going to see it all. And they're going to talk about it. They're going to write about it. They're going to think messianically with, this, with these data points. And they're going to say some amazing things in Second Temple text. And that's what we're going to cover next, because what they say is going to bleed into the New Testament, just like the Old Testament is going to bleed into the New Testament. So that when you get, you know, the writer, guys like the writer of the book of Hebrews, he's thinking about the Old Testament, but he's also thinking about the way his own ancestors and contemporaries thought about that Old Testament material. It's going to influence him. He's going to see things. They're going to help him think. They're going to help him make connections. And those connections are going to wind up in our New Testament. Mike, is there any new ideas that you're presenting here uh, about Melchizedek, or are there other scholars out there that are connecting dots like you? Oh yeah, there, there's 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 a pile of information on on Melchizedek. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll list a few things in the, in the bibliography or on the episode page. Um, some of it, you know, you know, I should a small portion of it uh, is accessible. Um, you know, to, to the normal person, but most of it's in, in literature. You know, there's a whole, um, I'm trying to think of what might be a really, it, it's cheap. It's a cheap little, little paperback. Um, there's a book called Melchizedek and Mel, Melchi Rasha, who's, the, who's sort of the bad guy equivalent. He's going to be the Satan figure, um, has a lot of this in it. Um, journal articles. Again, I, I can put a few journal articles and I'll, the ones I list on, on the, the episode page, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put those in the protected folder. I don't know. I, I might list some things on the episode page that aren't in the protected folder, but uh, listeners will at least get some of that. There just isn't much popularly written that ever really is text-based. You know, it, it really it really all springs from uh, the book of Hebrews, and that says, "Oh, by the way, this Melchizedek guy shows up in the Old Testament." You don't you don't really get all the stuff we talked about here in um, in popular discussions. You know, of, of Melchizedek. Is there anyone off the top of your head that you can think of or recommend that's trying to pin down who wrote what and when in the Torah? Oh, as far as the Torah, oh, that's a mess. Um, it's kind of like, um, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, Hebrew and Greek teachers. Everybody wants to write their own grammar. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a joke. Everybody thinks they can do it better. This is, this is what, what you got here. Uh, there are lots of theories about Torah, um, almost as many as there are scholars. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but there's really no one, there's no one volume. I mean, I, I could think of something like who wrote the Bible by Friedman, but he, he takes the classic JEDP thing, which I think is based on circular reasoning. Again, you, you read something like that and it sold over a million copies because it was written to the layperson. People were interested in it. But it's just this—it's the standard view, and again, it, it has some ser serious logical flaws to it. But it does point out interesting things, you know, that, that you have to deal with. So, it, you know, it's not a—to me, it's not a total loss. But 
I think probably the best thing that within the grasp of within the reach of uh, a lay person would be like a, a dictionary entry, maybe in like one of the InterVarsity Press dictionaries. But all that's going to do is give you an overview of what the what the problems are and, and what people have proposed. There's nothing that's just going to like, oh, that ends that debate. Thanks. We don't have to think about that anymore. <laughs> there's, there's nothing like that. All right. Sounds good. Well, real briefly again, Mike, what can we expect in part two? Part two is going to be intertestamental, Second Temple Jewish literature. How did they think about this Old Testament stuff? You know, what, what are some of the, the things they noticed and their speculations about Melchizedek? All right. Sounds good. Well, we knew Melchizedek was going to be information overload, which personally yep. I enjoy. These are my favorite episodes when you get into the, the, the nitty gritty like this. And uh, I, I, I love it. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 168, Melchizedek, part two. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, uh, we're out of the Old Testament into some new the literature. Second Temple period, yeah. yep. Yeah. Second Temple period, again, and, and both the Old Testament stuff and then this episode today are going to be the necessary backdrop for the New Testament material. We're going to drift into New Testament a little bit uh, today, like we, we sort of did a little bit. Uh, earlier on, talking about the Old Testament, but we're going to be talking about some things today that I think listeners will, you know, sort of it'll it'll perk up your ears because some of this stuff is going to sound New Testamenty more than even the Old Testament stuff. But for by by way of a summary, I guess a little bit of a recap with the Old Testament stuff, um, some of the sort of summary statements that we had uh, for that material. I'm just going to try to resummarize here and then we'll jump into second temple literature again and for those who may not be familiar with that term second temple literature second temple period is what we more popularly refer to as the intertestamental period so that period between old testament history and the beginning of the new testament there's lots of stuff going on there lots of stuff being written and there's some of that devoted to melchizedek so by way of again summarizing where we've been we have melchizedek again his name uh, could either be some you know, some sort of description, you know, my king is righteous, or it could be a theophoric name. My king is Tzedek. We talked a lot about that. Uh, we have this guy with a title, the king of Salem or Solom, and he was associated with some really important themes, kingship, uh, obviously, priesthood. Again, those, those are the two most apparent, but also Jerusalem. He was the king of Solom. We talked about how that's Jerusalem. Uh, even if his name is Theophoric Tzedek, who would be Yahweh in Israelite religion anyway, he is still associated with righteousness and peace because of the Tzedek term and the Solemn term in those either proper names or topographic name, you know, place name. At no point uh, in the Old Testament material, any of it, was there any sense that Melchizedek was more than a man. Uh, we, we, ne we never ran into anything that would indicate that people thought, uh, or he was portrayed is probably a better way to say it in the Old Testament as a divine being. He just, he just isn't. So he, uh, you know, when, when we look at him, the, you know, how, how we need to sort of focus on him, at least to this point, is just as a human being. He is the chief royal and priestly representative of the Most High God. That's who he is in the Old Testament. The divinity aspect of Melchizedek is something that's going to begin in what we cover today in the Second Temple period. Now, you know, since he is, I mean, think of it abstractly, since he is the chief royal and priestly representative of the Most High God, and that, think about the wording there. He's associated with kingship and priesthood. Uh, he's focused in, you know, Jerusalem, all these things. Those Items, those um, those terms, the, the and the motifs, the symbols, all, all the baggage, you know, the, the theological baggage that goes with that priesthood and, and kingship, and that's invariably going to get linked to Messiah, to a messianic figure, a deliverer figure, and once you're into messianic territory, then you start to be thinking a bit more again abstractly, theologically. Uh, the way you think about those things is going to sort of transcend uh, normative uh, time and place for for a number of Jews, and so it, it's it's not an abnormal thing that people would be thinking of Melchizedek 
as some sort of divine figure later on, because again, well, if he's really the re- the representative of the Most High God, then you know maybe God is you know is going to you know be behind this person in a special way, or is going to send him in a special way. And as people are speculating on who the Messiah is going to be and what's the Messiah going to be like, and they're you know, if you've read Unseen Realm, this is going to be familiar to you. But but if you if if we're thinking about the covenants and certain scenes in the Old Testament that involve the second Yahweh figure, the visible form of Yahweh as a man, the angel of the Lord, and how that terminology and certain episodes in which the angel plays an important part, how those sort of overlap with, again, important themes of covenant and kingship and even priesthood. And uh, you know, fighting Yahweh's battles, all all these things. Again, I, I use the phrase a lot, matrix of ideas, and that's what we, we're dealing with here. And Melchizedek becomes part of this matrix of ideas. And since that matrix contains not just kingship and priesthood, but also again this this figure of of the second Yahweh at some point. You know, again, depending on what passage you're in, all of those things get thrown into the blender. And so. When Jews in the Second Temple period look at all that, they look at at the whole matrix, all these these passages that are interconnected and the ideas that go along with them. There's going to be a few of those Jews that are, start thinking about the Messiah in divine terms. And, and since, again, Melchizedek is connected to the Davidic dynasty that would produce the Messiah, Allah, Psalm 110, they're going to be thinking about Melchizedek as a divine being too that maybe he is prototypical or a type of the Messiah. He's a prefigurement of the Messiah. And once you start thinking those thoughts, it opens the door to viewing Melchizedek as more than just a normal guy. And that's what's going to happen. Now, we also talked about in the Old Testament how the priesthood of Aaron was essentially a concession by God, plan B, if you will, in response to Moses' unbelief. Again, that uh, is is not something we're necessarily going to return to until we get to the New Testament, when the priesthood of Melchizedek is compared to the Aaronic priesthood. That's something we'll return to, not so much today, but uh, in in our New Testament episode we will. And that that's the mix that we're dealing with. Again, Melchizedek is linked to Abraham, is linked to Abraham's seed, is linked to Elyon, the Most High, is linked to Deuteronomy 32 which is linked to the divorce of the nations, which is, of course, linked to the reclaiming of those nations through the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant would produce a seed, which, of course, takes us to David, again, the the, the Davidic dynasty. And, of course, Melchizedek is a priest. And once we start talking about, uh, you know, the priesthood of Melchizedek being elevated or, or considered, you know, more ideal than the priesthood of Aaron, you know, you throw all that into the hopper. And this is, again, the the matrix of ideas that we're dealing with. The evidence in the text is that Melchizedek's kingship is connected to Abraham. It legitimizes the rule of Abraham's seed. And of course, the original Edenic king, Adam, was ruler and mediator. He was king and priest in, in a very broad you know, theological sense on earth because you know he was the guy that sort of stood between God and the rest of humanity, the rest of what would be his descendants. And he was again, put there in Eden to be a steward king, a, you know, a ruler of the earth in, in, a, in a positive sense. That all continues through the patriarchs up to Moses, and, and Moses it divides because of his unbelief. You know, we, we, God makes a concession and brings the, the priesthood of Aaron into the picture. Uh, it would seem reasonable to think, again, that having both those offices operate in one person was God's ideal, uh, because that, again, harkens back to Adam, and that is God's consistent plan. You know, God is meeting with a person, a patriarch, that, and that patriarch is the go-between be, between God and the rest of the people in the picture, the rest of the people that are concerned. But that breaks apart when we get to Moses again. So the, the ideal you know, would have been to have them both in, in one. And since this Melchizedek figure is the oldest you know, figure, you know, it sort of continues that the patriarchal idea. Uh, better than Moses did, he gets referenced in Psalm 110 and connected to David's line and ultimately the Messiah. So you have to be thinking about all these things sort of at once and how they touch each other to make sense of what, of how Melchizedek is portrayed in the Old Testament and even more importantly, how he's thought about once these ideas again are all in, in the blender. And that brings us to the Second Temple period.
So today we want to get into the literature here, and you know we're gonna we're gonna end up focusing mostly on Dead Sea Scroll material, but we'll hit a few other things. Melchizedek is mentioned in a number of Second Temple works, again works or at least works that scholars figure date back into the Second Temple period. I, I say it that way because of issues with books like Second Enoch. Now I have no idea if any of you have a dictionary of the New, of New Testament background. I have no idea why DNTB has Second Enoch as, quote, the earliest uh, instance in, in the Second Temple literature of a mention of Melchizedek, because the text just doesn't date itself into the Second Temple period. But I, I thought I'd throw that out in case one of you has that resource. You, it might just sound odd, because it, it honestly does sound odd. The manuscript evidence for Second Enoch is Slavonic, which is the 14th century. And if you look at Charlesworth, Old Testament pseudepigrapha volume, uh, where he talks about Second Enoch, would be volume one. Uh, the guy who wrote the chapter on Second Enoch is uh, Francis Anderson. And Anderson suggests a Greek work, you know, that Second Enoch was a Greek work no older than 1000 AD, which is well after the Second Temple period. Nevertheless, you know, everybody figures, hey, you know, it's Enochian material. There, there's a lot of, of that stuff that's really old. So Second Enoch kind of becomes part of the picture here. We're, we're not going to, because of the textual issue, the manuscript issue, uh, I'll admit, again, that Second Enoch has things in it that are probably as old as the Second Temple period, because, hey, that's when, where First Enoch is, and there's going to be overlap there. But I'm, I'm not going to spend really any time on, on Second Enoch here. I'm going to go right to sources whose manuscript evidence play, place them firmly in the Second Temple period. So let's start with uh, Josephus. Melchizedek is mentioned in Josephus's uh, sixth volume of his his war, his his book about the wars, the wars of the Jews. And in my edition, uh, that would be it would be lines four thirty five to four thirty eight. I think the 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 line numbering is pretty consistent. But I'm just going to read you the passage. So this is from Josephus, in the Jewish Wars, volume six, beginning in line four thirty five. He writes. And thus was Jerusalem taken in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, on the eighth day of the month, Gorpaeus, which is Elul. It had been taken five times before, though this was the second time of its desolation. For Shishak, the king of Egypt, and after him Antiochus, and after him Pompey, and after them, Sosius and Herod took the city, but still preserved it. But before all these, the king of Babylon conquered it and made it desolate. Of course, there's the reference to Nebuchadnezzar. 1,468 years and six months after it was built. But he who first built it was a potent man among the Canaanites and is on our tongue called Melchizedek, the righteous king, for such he really was, on which account he was there the first priest of God and first built a temple there and called the city Jerusalem, which was formerly called Solom. Now that is you know, the, the excerpt from Josephus where he mentions Melchizedek. And obviously, and kind of interestingly, Melchizedek is considered uh, the person who built the first temple. And you say, well, that's kind of odd because I thought Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. Well, he, 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 built, the, he built the first Israelite temple, Josephus would say. But Josephus is thinking, well, there was a temple there because Melchizedek was priest of the Most High, you know, Most High God. And you know, there had to be a temple there. And so he credits all that with, to Melchizedek. He credits Melchizedek with building the city. Again, the Old Testament doesn't say any of that stuff. But, you know, that's what that's what Josephus is thinking. And again, he's likely not alone. But notice, even despite all of that embellishment, Melchizedek is considered a historical human. There's There's no hint in what we just read that he's thought of as a divine being by Josephus. So here's here's a clear Second Temple period example where Melchizedek is mentioned, talked about. Again, some things are added to the Old Testament, but he's not a divine person, not a divine being. Now, if we go to Philo, again, Philo was another really important writer in this period. Philo found room both for a sort of literal historical interpretation of Melchizedek as a human being and a sort of more than literal interpretation of Melchizedek as the Logos. And of course, Logos is the term in John 1, you know, for the Word, the Word of God. You know, Jesus, of course, was the Word. And if you've read Unseen Realm, you know that that thinking is not just from Philo or from some Platonic this and that. Uh, you have Word of the Lord being the visible human Yahweh in the Old Testament. 
And you have even more uh, of those instances if you read the Targums, you know, the Aramaic translations of the Old Testament. So there, there's a lot of evidence. It, it doesn't force you to go out to Greco-Roman philosophy, which is, you know, what Philo was working in a lot to get a Logos doctrine. You don't, you don't need that stuff. But Philo certainly uh, has his head in that. And for him, Melchizedek gets sort of parsed as the Logos, you know, as, as a divine figure. Now, I'm going to read uh, an excerpt here from DDD by Reiling, uh, R-E-I-L-I-N-G. And he has an entry on uh, Melchizedek, and he, he goes into the Philo material a little bit, and I kind of like his summary. It's pretty convenient here. So he writes, Philo mentions Melchizedek in three places. We have, if I can get the abbreviations correctly here, I always you know, kind of mess up the abbreviations in, in Philo, uh, on Abraham. And then we have the book that is referred to as preliminary studies, at least by scholars. And then thirdly, the allegorical interpretation, volume three. Those are the three works of Philo where Melchizedek is mentioned. So continuing with Riley, he says, in the Abraham book, again, on Abraham, in On Abraham 235, the story of Genesis 14, 18 through 20 is retold and embellished. Melchizedek is called the great priest of the Most High God. Thinking that Abraham's success was due to divine wisdom and help, he stretched his hands to heaven and honored him with prayers and offered sacrifices on his behalf and entertained him and his men lavishly. In the subsequent allegorical interpretation of the story of Abraham's warfare, that is Genesis 14, 1 through 24, Melchizedek is not mentioned again uh, by Philo. He acts as a historical person only. In preliminary studies, 99, Melchizedek is mentioned in an excursus on the number 10. Those are lines 89 through 120 in that book of Philo, preliminary studies, with reference to the fact that Abraham gave him one-tenth of everything. That's Genesis 14, 20. So I'll just stop here and pause. So for Philo, Philo reads this, you know, that Abraham give, gives uh, 10% to Melchizedek, and then he goes off on some excursus about the meaning of the number 10. That's, that's the context for him discussing Melchizedek in that, that particular book. Back to Riling here. He says, this is interpreted metaphorically, again, this tenth of everything. Everything, quote unquote, comprises the things of sense and speech and thought. Melchizedek is identified as the man who obtained the self-learned and self-taught priesthood probably because no priest is mentioned before him in the Bible, and later priesthood is not derived from him. In Allegorical Interpretation, Volume 3, this is 79 through 82, Melchizedek is presented as an example of people who are honored by God without having done beforehand something to please him. It's kind of interesting. He was made king by God, and he was the first to be worthy to be his priest. In Philo's perspective, catch this, this is Riling again, writing about this. In Philo's perspective, Melchizedek, as a king and priest, does not cease to be a historical person, but at the same time serves as the embodiment of the divine logos and transcends history. And you say, well, that's the end of the quote. And you say, well, how does that, how does that work? You know, I'm, I'm trying to follow Philo's thinking here. What, what in the world is he? You know, look, your guess is as good as anybody else's. Philo's writing, this is what it's like. Philo will go off on these riffs of allegorical interpretation, speculation about the meaning of numbers and, and things like this, and you just wonder what set him off, you know, what put him on that path, what what uh, suggested these things to him. And again, the honest answer is sometimes you can sort of figure that out uh, because of the, the mass of material he might be discussing at some other place, but other times it's just really dense and obtuse. And honestly, even specialists in Philo have no no idea why. You know, he, he went in, in you know, this or that direction. So it, it, it's a little bit up in the air. Again, sometimes Philo, his thinking is discernible. You can, you can track with him and, and know why he's saying what he's saying. Other times you just can't. But this is, this is where he's at. He associates Melchizedek with the Logos. So he's an important resource in the Second Temple period that is beginning to think about Melchizedek as something not unhistorical, but more than a man. Again, that's why we want to mention him. Now, third source, third resource anyway, Qumran literature, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is where we're going to spend the lion's share of our time because there's a specific text here that's really important. 
Melchizedek is mentioned twice in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a there's the Genesis Apocryphon. Uh, that's one Q A P Genesis G G E N in uh, the the twenty second column. In that, you know, just 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 look at the title Genesis Apocryphon. He, this is a retelling of the story of Genesis. So naturally, you're going to hit Genesis fourteen eighteen through twenty. And in this Dead Sea Scroll, that passage from the Old Testament is translated more or less literally. Uh, there are a few little minor additions to the story, but nothing really you know, spectacular. Melchizedek is presented pretty straightforwardly as a historical person. And there's no real speculation about his name or like in Philo's case about what 10th means and, and all that. There, there's none of that. It's just a straightforward translation. This This particular Dead Sea Scroll is in Aramaic. So it's put into Aramaic and... Uh, on on we go. We we move on, you know, through through other material in Genesis. So there isn't that much that's added that would be sort of speculative, which is quite different, you know, than than Philo and quite different from um, you know from other texts as well. Now the the big one, the big deal for Second Temple literature, and I had to go through this text a lot, you know, for my dissertation, is something called Eleven Q Melchizedek, also known as Eleven Q thirteen. As the title suggests, this is from Cave 11. That's what the numbers are for, 11Q, 11 Qumran. It's Qumran Cave 11, and it gets its name Melchizedek because of the content. 13 would refer to the number of the manuscripts. These are all fragmentary, but column 2, is it's still fragmentary, but column 2 has a lot of content in it. Uh, and since column 2 is drawing on Old Testament texts, even when there are some holes that they can be filled in if, you know, if they're citing Old Testament verses, you can just go look at what the content was. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, a translation of this text. And when there is an Old Testament verse referenced, I will tell you what the verse is. And then we will, we'll, we'll discuss it. I'm going to share, again, some, uh, the research of some scholars who specialize on this text and, and Second Temple literature uh, and New Testament on the New Testament, just generally. But I'm going to read through this text, and the translation is from uh, Garcia Martinez and Tig Killar, their uh, Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition. Uh, if you have that, you could follow along. If you can, you know, read Hebrew. There, you know, there's going to be a couple places here you might want to check the the Hebrew. But uh, at any rate, here's what it says. Again, this is Column Two, Eleven Q Melchizedek. I think you're going to find it really interesting. Again, th this is. This is pre-New Testament. Pre-New Testament. There's no question about the dating of the manuscript. So line one is fragmentary, and it doesn't really, it can't be read. Line two, we get into text, and it says, and as for what he said, and then he's going to quote Leviticus 25, 13, in this year of Jubilee, you shall return each one to his respective property. Concerning it, he said, now he's going to quote Deuteronomy 15, 2. This is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he lent to his neighbor. He shall not coerce his neighbor or his brother, for it has been proclaimed a release for God. It's interpretation. Can he, Hebrew or Aramaic, you know, pishro. Okay. So the, I'll just stop there. This is line four. When you see this pishro in a text, you, it, you can tell right away it's it's what scholars call midrash, which... I, I, it's an explanation. It's something, it's sort of like a commentary, even though that it's not like an official, there are commentaries uh, in, in the Qumran literature that are verse by verse commentaries on Old Testament books. This text is going to actually combine a bunch of different verses and then offer commentary uh, on, on the combination thereof. But we, it, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not verse by verse in one text, but it is nevertheless a, a commentary. It's an interpretation. So back to line four. Its interpretation for the last days refers to captives. So let me just stop there. He's saying, well, here's why I quoted Leviticus 25, 13 and Deuteronomy 15, 2, this whole thing about Jubilee and returning the property and everything like that. The reason I did that, I'm pretending to be the writer of Melchizedek, is because in the last days, the last days refer to captives. Back to the text, who, and then there's a gap, and whose teachers have been hidden and kept secret and from the inheritance of Melchizedek. For they are the inheritance of Melchizedek, who will make them return, and liberty will be proclaimed for them, to free them from the debt of all their iniquities. And this will happen in the first week of the Jubilee, which follows the nine Jubilees. 
and the day of atonement is the end of the tenth jubilee, in which atonement shall be made for all the sons of light and for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. Over them, and then there's a gap, according to all their works, for it is the time for the year of grace of Melchizedek and of his armies, the nation of the holy ones of God, of the rule of judgment. Now that's the end of line nine. And I'm going to stop there because of what something that happens in line 10. But you see, this is Mike talking now, you know, you see what, what's going on here. He's saying, look, he takes a concept of the Jubilee and, and, and slavery, you know, captives. And you can, you can tell already he's thinking that in the end times, the end times is, is, is something, the latter days is something about the release of the captives. Now, if you're a Jew and you're still under Roman dominion and, and you know, whatnot, this is something that you expect the Messiah to do. You expect the Messiah to come back and get rid of Rome and release. You know, you, you, you make you free. Everybody goes back to the land. You know, you, you restore the, the Levitical system. Uh, but he's also throwing in sort of chronological marks here about the, the Jubilee and the Day of Atonement. If you remember back to when we, we discussed this kind of language in relationship to the book of Ezekiel, and even the you know, the last episode we did, the, the, this, which was the second episode on Ezekiel 40 through 48, we made the comment that over 60 times in Ezekiel 40 through 48, you have Jubilee language. And I made the comment that that, that was not coincidental. And, and we need to interpret Ezekiel 40 to 48 as, as something more than a literal temple being rebuilt. And we, we talked about all the problems with that view. But if you look at it as abs, you know, abstractly and connect it with the Jubilee, there were all sorts of, of ways you could connect Ezekiel 40 through, through 48 with New Testament talk about the Messiah's body being the temple and how his, and his followers being the temple and, and associating the Messiah, again, with the Jubilee release. This is what the writer of this text, 11Q Melchizedek, is thinking. He's thinking along the same lines that you know, connecting the, the end of days, you know, the last times with this Jubilee release and the Jubilee cycles. And you know, just to quote him again, we have here the uh, the first week of the Jubilee, which follows the nine Jubilees. The Day of Atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee. Again, you get these, these Jubilee year cycles. And so he's associating that with this release. Now, you might be thinking already, well, boy, that, that passage about setting the captives free, where have I heard that before? Okay, well, you've heard that in Jesus' first sermon when he launches his ministry in Nazareth, he quotes Isaiah 61, again, about the release of the captives, you know, the, the whole Jubilee concept. It's really interesting that here you have a Jew. This is 100, 200 years, you know, before the New Testament period, thinking about the end of days in terms of a Jubilee year release. And he associates it with Melchizedek for some reason. And we've talked about, you know, in our Old Testament discussions, we've talked about what those reasons might be, because Melchizedek, again, is this ideal king-priest. He is tied to the Davidic dynasty from which the Messiah will come, a la Psalm 110. So this guy here is tracking on Melchizedek. I'll read verse 9 again. It is the time for the year of grace of Melchizedek and of his armies. His armies, the nation of the holy ones of God, of the rule of judgment, as it is written. Now, let's go into verse 10. This is going to be kind of mind-blowing here. So he's, he's talking about Melchizedek and his armies, the, you know, the nation of the holy ones of God. And he's already talked about the sons of light, okay? Now, obviously, their enemies are going to be the sons of the darkness and, and all that sort of stuff. But here we go. Verse 9 again. It is the time for the year of grace of Melchizedek and of his armies, the nation of the holy ones of God, of the rule of judgment, as it is written about him in the songs of David, who said, and he quotes Psalm 82, verse 1, David, songs of David, who said, Elohim will stand in the assembly of God, in the midst of the gods he judges. And about him, he said, now he quotes Psalm 7, 8, and 9, and above it to the heights return. God will judge the peoples. As for what he said, Psalm 82 again, verse 2, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Its interpretation, Pishro, here's what he thinks it means. Its interpretation concerns Belial, who again is a Satan figure, and the spirits of his lot, who, turning aside from the commandments of God to commit evil. And then there's a gap. 
Okay, let's just stop there. The writer of 11Q Melchizedek associates Melchizedek with being God. Okay, Psalm 82.1, the capital G-O-D in Psalm 82.1, he thinks is Melchizedek, who is standing in the assembly of God in the midst of the gods and judging them. I mean, just think about that. And we, you know, if you've read Unseen Realm, you you know all about how you know, you know all about Psalm eighty two, and you also know all about you know, the the whole two Yahweh's idea that there were two Yahweh figures in Old Testament thinking, and this is the foundation for the the later uh, ancient Jewish doctrine of two powers in heaven. You know, two two good guys, two Yahweh figures. And I've mentioned in, in many cases, and some of you have either seen me lecture on this on YouTube or, or maybe live in, at some place, there was lots of speculation in the Second Temple period about who the second Yahweh figure was. Okay, we know in the Old Testament he, he shows up as a man, he's visible, but who is that? You know, what's his identity? And I, I've made comment before about some thought he was an exalted Old Testament figure like, you know, like David, okay, or Abraham or Moses, or in this case, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is one of the two powers candidates uh, that get floated um, in Jewish writings of the Second Temple period. And it's very clear here. He, he, he associates Melchizedek with being the one who is judging the gods in Psalm 82. And again, he associates that with the release of people in bondage to the kind of misery that the gods are inflicting upon them. Now, at this point, you have to, you know, you have to suspend what what you know a little bit, you know, because you, some of you are probably thinking, well, well, the, he's wrong because Psalm 82 is about the gods of the nations, and those are Gentiles. That has nothing to do with the release of the jubilees. And you know, okay, we get that. We're just saying we're just reading through a text that explains what this particular Jewish writer was thinking. He is associating Melchizedek with the Lord of the Council, and I've done the same thing with Jesus, where. In John chapter 10, Jesus quotes Psalm 82. You know, we did a whole episode on that. Can you get the idea, the, the, these sorts of connections, you know, of, of, of identifying particular individuals? Again, Christians are going to do this with Jesus, obviously. Uh, and, it, and again, isn't it a coincidence that Jesus gets compared, analogized to Melchizedek in the New Testament? Again, we'll get there. But there are Jews who were there before. Again, they're, they're thinking of Melchizedek as being more than a man, and they're associating him here in believe it or not, with Psalm 82, Psalm 82, verse 1. And Melchizedek is the leader. You know, remember, remember verse 9, his armies? He's the leader of armies that are, are going to liberate the peoples of, of the earth, okay? He's going to liberate them, and he's going to go to war with Belial, the Satan figure, and the spirits of his lot. Now, if you know anything about Dead Sea Scroll stuff, there's a very famous scroll called the War Scroll. It's a one one QM as memory serves. Um, that describes the apocalyptic, you know, end of days battle, and it's a war between gods and men, and and on both sides you have human combatants and divine combatants fighting it out, you know, in heaven and on earth, you know, for for basically all the marvels. This is the kind of thing that that this text is alluding to. This same idea, you know, where you have this this warfare going on. Let's go back to, to the text now. I'll, I'll pick it up in verse 12. So it's interpretation. Again, this is what he thinks it means. Concerns Belial and the spirits of his lot, who, turning aside from the commandments of God to commit evil, and then we, it, it just drops off there, line 13. But Melchizedek will carry out the vengeance of God's judgments, and on that day he will free them from the hand of Belial and from the hand of all the spirits of his lot, to his aid shall come all the gods of justice. And he is the one who, and then there's a gap in the text, all the sons of God, and, and there's another gap, isn't that frustrating? <laughs> just, I'll read line 14 over again. To his aid shall come all the gods of justice. Isn't that interesting? Gods of justice, gods of Tzedek. Okay, you know. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about Sedek, you know, with, with uh, Melchizedek in the prior two episodes. But here we have this line, he shall, he shall, you know, to his aid shall come all the gods of, of, of Sedek. In other words, the rest of Yahweh's, you know, heavenly host army is going to come help Melchizedek, you know, win this battle. Line 15, this is the day of peace about which he said, and then there's a gap, 
through Isaiah the prophet who said, now he's going to quote Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, the messenger of good who announces salvation, saying to Zion, your God reigns. Pishro, its interpretation. The mountains are the prophets. Before you think that's really odd, you just, just you know, bear with him. He's a second temple Jewish guy, and this is what they're thinking. The mountains are the prophets, line 18, and the messenger is the anointed of the Spirit, as Daniel said about him. Now he's going to quote Daniel 9.25. The messenger is the anointed of the Spirit, as Daniel said about him, until an anointed, a prince, it is seven weeks, unquote. And the messenger of good who announces salvation is the one about whom it is written to comfort the afflicted. Pishro, its interpretation, that means to instruct them in all the ages of the world. Line 21 has two words, in truth, and then there's nothing. Line 22 is fragmentary. It says, has turned away from Belial and will return, then it ends. Line 23 says, in the judgments of God as it is written about him, quoting Isaiah 52, 7 again, saying to Zion, your God rules. Zion is the congregation of all the sons of justice. Those who establish the covenant, those who avoid walking on the path of the people. And your God, this is the way the text, the, the column ends, your God is Melchizedek, who will free them from the hand of Belial. And as for what he said, quotes Leviticus 25, 9, you shall blow the horn in all the land of, and then it breaks off. That's column two, 11Q Melchizedek. There's a lot of strange stuff in there. And for our purposes, what I want you to store away as we continue in our discussion here is that you very clearly have a second temple Jew. When they think about Melchizedek, they are thinking of a divine being. They're, they're, and I would say they're thinking about the second Yahweh figure. This is a candidate. Um, who will who is at the head of the armies of God himself, and this Jew views Melchizedek as being the Elohim who is going to judge the gods over the nations, otherwise known to him as the the uh, spirits of Belial, the spirits of Belial's lot, those who are you know under the power, under the influence, in league with Satan, essentially. Uh, again, the, the way the way scholars and myself included, again, parse Psalm eighty two is a little bit different, you know that, that and that's fine. Just that the eleven Mel, eleven Q Melchizedek tells you what one guy, you know, one author was thinking, and it's very very clear that Melchizedek is just more than a, than a man, and he even brings in verses concepts to talk about Melchizedek in ways that the New Testament writers will talk about Jesus. Okay. Now, Melchizedek is also mentioned. Um, his name is mentioned in 11Q17. That's really all you get, just the name. There's another fragment, uh, 4Q401, fragment 11. It, it just There's three lines. There's only a few words. It has priests of, and then there's a break, and then gods of knowledge, break. And then line three, Melchizedek, priest in the assembly of God. <laughs> again, it's, it's hearkening back to, to Psalm 82 again. So that's what you get. You know, with 11Q Melchizedek, otherwise known as 11Q13. Now, what I want to do at this point is I want to read you uh, some excerpts from a couple of papers. One is published uh, in in the Journal for the Study of Judaism at the in the in the Persian Hellenistic and Roman period. Um, it's by Delcor. The title is Melchizedek from Genesis to the Qumran Texts and the Epistle to the Hebrews. And then a little bit from uh, uh, Jim Davila's. SBL seminar paper back in 1996. Delcor's article, by the way, is 1971. But uh, 20 some years later, 1996, Davila gave a, an SBL paper entitled Melchizedek, Michael, and the War in Heaven. And I want to quote a, a few things from both of those papers. Okay, we're, we're, we'll start with Delcor, and this is on pages 124 and 125. Again, just just reading you know, his commentary on what we just read. He's talking about 11Q Melchizedek. So he writes, the character Melchizedek appears in an incomplete text of Cave 11 of Qumran, published by Vanderwood. In this fragment, written in Hebrew, Melchizedek appears as an eschatological savior who has a heritage. His mission is to bring back at the end of days the exiles to announce to them their liberation and the expiation of their sins. The fragment here takes up in part Isaiah 61.1 
and at least conceptually, which Luke applies to Jesus in Luke 4.18. Melchizedek appears also as a celestial being, Elohim, who stands in the assembly of God and on this occasion will judge the heavenly ones. Okay. In the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. Psalm 82.1. Those are the ones he's judging. Delcor continues, he participates in the vengeance of the judgment of God. Here we find, though with some modification taken up, Psalm 82.1 and Isaiah 61.2. Melchizedek is thus apparently identified with Michael, who also appears in Qumran as a celestial being in the War Scroll 1QM. In fact, Melchizedek is helped by the celestial armies in his struggle against Belial and his angels. We will see later the interest of these speculations on the person of Melchizedek as a celestial being for a better understanding of the epistle to the Hebrews. As the scriptures speak neither of the birth nor the death of this person, Melchizedek, it is easy to imagine him to be eternal and therefore that this priest should be present in the heavens. The author of the Qumran fragment did not hesitate to indulge in these speculations. Davila writes this, the theme of the eschatological war in heaven between the angelic forces of good and the demonic forces of evil was a topic of great interest in early Jewish and Christian literature. The focus of this paper is the reflexes of this story, which name Michael or Melchizedek as the leader of the heavenly army. Skipping ahead to the next paragraph, when a leader of the battling angels is mentioned in these texts, he is almost always either Michael or Melchizedek. It seems clear that the two were identified, at least in some circles. In Qumran sectarian literature, each appears as the head of the angelic hosts at the eschatological battle in different texts. Based on this fact, as well as contextual considerations, Millick suggested that a fragmentary passage in the visions of Amram, 4Q544, originally listed them together as names of the angel of light. So that's, I'll just break in there. There's, a, there's this character in this text, the angel of light. And what Davila is saying is these might be named, Michael and Melchizedek might be names for that particular angel. Again, because the texts have related content. Now let's go down a little bit to, uh, okay, another third paragraph for Davila. The relationship of these two angels, Michael and Melchizedek, or Michael and the Angel of Light. Again, it's not really clear what Davil was referring to there. It's the, the, the prose is a little little bit obscure. But the relationship of these two angels and how they came to be associated with one another. He's probably referring to Melchizedek here, even though Melchizedek's not an angel, but maybe he's saying the, an angel in, in this text anyway. But their relationship is one of the issues to be considered in in this study. And he spends a lot of time trying to explicate this. Moving on, he says, the narrative of column two, which we just read, describes the eschatological conflict fought by the divine being Melchizedek and his angelic allies against Belial and the evil spirits of his lot. And then Davila goes on to compare the language of 11Q Melchizedek with the war scroll and some other things where Michael is, is the picture. So basically what his article is going to be about, at least in this section, is how Michael and Melchizedek sort of play the same role. And they're in, a, in this battle that's described the same way in various texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this is me now. We're, we're done with the quotations. I don't believe uh, that Michael was the second power. In other words, was the second Yahweh figure. Or, or I don't believe that Michael is the angel of the Lord. Now, some do. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists in particular you know, take that position. Uh, they're not the only ones, but they certainly take it. I think the idea is contradicted, actually, by two places in Daniel, and that's kind of material for another episode, but just so that you know, I don't, I don't think Michael is the angel of the Lord. I think there's problems with that. The point for our purposes here are that some Jews made that equation. Okay, some Jews thought that. Now, I think personally that this thinking okay, is tied to the second power in heaven, second Yahweh figure. And we have here an exalted angel, again, cast as, as the second power in heaven, and the, the most obvious candidate is Michael. But some Jews, again, thought this was Melchizedek exalted to some sort of heavenly state, and he becomes glorified or something like that. Now, Michael is Israel's prince. Melchizedek was a priest king. Now, I think in part, the way they're, they're sort of thought about together is because the captain of the Lord's host, remember Joshua 5? The captain of the Lord's host is clearly divine. 
Okay, this is, if you remember Joshua 5, you know, Joshua encounters the captain of the commander of the Lord's host, and he says, you know, what side are you, you know, who are you, dude? You know, what side are you on? He says, I'm the commander of the Lord's host. And then he says, hey, you know, the place where you're standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals. It's the same language that you get in, in Exodus 3 with, with the burning bush. Exactly the same. So, you know, the, the, the commander of the Lord's host is a divine being. And since we have this connection back to Exodus 3, uh, I think he's the angel of the Lord. I think he's the angel of the Lord for a different reason. And I, and I, I discuss all of this in Unseen Realm because the description of the commander of the Lord's of the Lord's army there in Joshua 5 describes the, the commander there as having a drawn sword in his hand. Okay. The Hebrew phrase for that, exactly, the exact Hebrew phrase occurs only two other times in the Hebrew Bible. One is in First Chronicles 20, uh, 16. The other one is in Numbers 22. I think it's verse 24. But they both explicitly in those two other passages say that the, the person with the drawn sword in his hand is the angel of the Lord. So I, I think there's a really, really uh, powerful case here to identify the commander of Yahweh's host in Joshua 5 as the Malach Adonai, as, as the angel of the Lord. Now, you know, if that's the case, well, it, it, it kind of makes sense, at least to some Jews, that to, to think of that figure, the angel of the Lord, as Michael, because he's the commander of, of Yahweh's armies on behalf of Israel, and Michael is called Israel's prince. So they, they sort of conflate those two things. That's how that's how people argue that Michael is the angel of the Lord. Again, I think there's problems with that when you get into some passages in Daniel. But nevertheless, I just want you to know how how would you would would get there, you know, how how the thinking would go. They also, again, if if you're the prince of Israel, well, that sounds, you know, kind of messianic. That's like kind of messiah talk, prince of Israel, you know. And so, once you go there, then you do start thinking about Melchizedek. Why? Because Melchizedek, you know, the, the, the Davidic king in Psalm 110 is declared to be, you know, after the order of Melchizedek. And so this is how, if you're a Jew, you could justify thinking, okay, angel of the Lord, Michael, Melchizedek, ah, they're all the same guy. This is how you would get there. This is how you would argue that. And of course, the Messiah is, is, is your leader at the great eschatological battle. I mean, who else would it be? So you, again, you have, you have these ideas that are very, I think, I think pretty easy to see how, how Jews would have conflated all of these things into one figure. And so when you have Jews writing in the Second Temple period, you have some of them use Melchizedek, some of them use Michael. You, know, you got that one that says angel of light, you know, like, you know, he, maybe he's just the oddball out here. But everybody else is talking about Melchizedek or Michael. And if you're thinking of, of that figure in those terms— Again, tying it back to Joshua 5, be, being the, the guy in charge of, of Yahweh's armies. Well, you know, then you could look at Psalm 82 and say, well, look, what's being described here in Psalm 82, judgment of the nations, you know, and, and a, a Jew would look at that. And, and again, this particular Jew who wrote 11 Q. Melchizedek associates the reclaiming of the nations in, in a final eschatological sense and the death of the gods in a final sense. With the release of the captives, you know, it, it, and Israel is released from exile. You know, the you know the the separation from God is over. You know, our our captivity is over. You know, we're forgiven, and the Messiah is here again. You have to you have to get rid of the New Testament in your head. None of that's happened yet, and so this is your vision as a Jew of what's going to happen when when the Messiah returns. Of course, you know we're going to be liberated. You know, everything's going to be set right. It's the day of the Lord, you know, kind of thinking. You know, they're, they're not thinking about, you know, oh, he's going to come. He's going to go and die on a cross. He's going to rise again. Remember, again, we've discussed this at length in, in Unseen Realm and at length on this podcast, how the plan of redemption was cryptic. They weren't supposed to know. What they're thinking is messianic deliverance the restoration of the kingdom. And, and quite frankly, that's what the powers of darkness are thinking too, because it's like, well, he's back here, the son of the most high is back here to reclaim his turf and the silly talk about restoring Eden. Well, this is our turf now. We're going to kill the guy. I mean, th this is what they were expecting. This is what they knew. The, the, the redemptive sort of aspect to it, the salvific sort of aspect, that is fragmented in lots of places. It's never spelled out and they miss it. And, and here you have Second Temple texts that are tracking, you know, along the, the militaristic theme. And if you're, if you're doing that, and you see, again, going back to Joshua 5, here you have the commander of the Lord's host, obviously divine being. Well, that, you know, Michael's the prince, so th these two guys must be the same. And, 
who else would lead the battle in the last day but the Messiah? So Michael and this guy must be the Messiah as well. And hey, if it's the Messiah, we got to bring Melchizedek into the question because the Messiah, the son of David in Psalm 110 is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you, you can put all these things together and that's what they do. They don't have any of the stuff that that is, is probably you know, lurking around in, in, in our heads about the New Testament, because we're not even at the New Testament yet. This is pre-Jesus stuff in the Second Temple period. But this is how you get the portrait that a guy you know, who's writing in Second or in 11 Q Melchizedek, this is how he would get there. Now, from reversing Hermon, I want to read a little bit that relates to this, again, just to bring uh, you know, that material into this discussion. This is from chapter 10. Again, this is talking about how another another element to getting to this portrait is to focus on who the enemy is again the the, the Belial figure and the you know the, the bad guys on the other side of the apocalyptic war again i'm what i'm doing here is i'm just fleshing out for you how a jew would have been thinking about this material and how they get to this profile where michael melchizedek messiah they're all the same guy and they're fighting you know the sons of belial and and you know the, the big bad guy on the other side and all that so here's another element to it from reversing Hermon in chapter 10, in a pseudepigraphical work known as The Assumption of Moses, a work whose content shows up in the New Testament book of Jude, we read the following passage. This is chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Uh, actually, actually, I'm just going to give you one. And there will come upon them punishment and wrath, such as never happened to them from the creation till the time when he stirs up against them, a king of the kings of the earth who having supreme authority will crucify those who confess their circumcision. And the interesting line here is the reference to, quote, a king of the kings of the earth. The writer is clearly citing Psalm 2, verse 2, which is a messianic psalm about how the kings of the nations will rise up against the Messiah. And he transforms the verse to point to a great leader of those kings. So Psalm 2, too, talks about the Gentiles rising up you know, against the Messiah. But the writer of the Assumption of Moses turns that phrase into a king of the kings of the earth. So you have a great end times enemy that's in, in view in the Assumption of Moses here. Now, Horbury, who's a New Testament scholar, uh, writes, Jewish sources from the end of the Second Temple period, which describe an antichrist-like figure without using the term, name him rather as the wicked one or Gog, or Beliar. These sources can be said to bridge the gap between the biblical passages already noted, which attest to the expectations of a messianic victory and of a final arch enemy of Israel. Horbury's point, this is me now, is that while a developed doctrine of Antichrist is indeed of Christian origin, the component of that Christian teaching that had the Antichrist as an imperial tyrant bent on opposing the rule of Messiah is pre-Christian and of Jewish origin. Horbury's reference to the wicked one, Gog or Beliar, brings us to a third background element. Again, this is chapter 10 in Reversing Hermon, so I'm referring to something earlier. Brings us to another element for our discussion of the beast, the Antichrist. Belial, also spelled Beliar in some Dead Sea Scrolls, is the leader of the powers of darkness. Okay, that, that's pretty obvious. Now, I, I quote a, a, a fellow named here, uh, Torleif Elgvin or Elgvin. And he summarizes how, you know, how this works, the great you know, end times enemy, how this works in, in Jewish expectation. He writes, the New Testament concepts of Satan and his host are closely related to ideas that develop in intertestamental period and are found in early Jewish literature. In their interpretation of Old Testament passages, various books among the pseudepigrapha and Qumran literature give different explanations to the presence of evil in the world. Some writings describe the struggle between good and evil as a cosmic spiritual struggle and anticipate the ultimate annihilation of evil and the evil powers. In some texts, the evil powers have an angelic leader named Shemhaza or Mastema or Belial or the Prince of Darkness. The earliest post-biblical source that elaborates on evil angelic forces is probably the Enochic Book of the Watchers, 1st Enoch 6 through 16. These chapters interpret Genesis 6, 1 through 5. The angelic watchers cohabit with earthly women and bring magic, sin, and violence to the earth. Enoch has shown the coming judgment on the angels, who in vain ask him to intercede for them. Their leader is Shem Chaza, but he is not portrayed as a cosmic opponent to God or the elect. Again, in that text, but later on, again, he will be. 
it, people will take take that name and apply it to the the great end times enemy who will oppose and confront and battle with Messiah. Now, Elgin's view of the data, overview of the data, shows that for Second Temple period Jewish theology, the leader of the Watchers went by various names, Shemhaza, Mastama, Belial, the Prince of Darkness. And the last title has obvious overlap with the way New Testament's you know, rights of Satan. So this is how, again, on the flip side, this is how Jews were, were thinking. This is why you have this, this final war described the way it is. When when you see in these texts, Belial, Beliar, Mastama, Shemchaza, these are all in, in, in the mind of certain Jewish writers. They're all sort of other words for Satan. And so naturally, at the end of days, his opponent will be the Messiah. And, you know, you, you have this messianic profile that has Messiah as a warrior. Well, that's the captain of the Lord's host in Joshua 5. And he's a son of David. That brings Melchizedek into the equation because of Psalm 110. And of course, Michael is the prince of Israel. So it, it must be all the same guy. I mean, this is how you get the, the end times eschatology, or at least the apocalyptic battle, who the characters are and, and what's happening and why. This is how you get there in Second Temple Jewish thinking. Now, again, you know, I'm not going to take all those positions. Again, I think there's a, there's a problem with uh, the Michael-Melchizedek equation, Michael as the angel of the Lord, and so on and so forth. And we'll hit that you know, at, at another time. Probably when we hit the New Testament, maybe I'll bring some of that in or we'll do a, 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 an episode of, it, of its own on that. But if we go back to 11Q Melchizedek with, with all this thing, we've got the good guy. You know, it goes by various names. We've got the bad guy. It goes by various names. And in 11 Q Melchizedek, the good guy, the leader, you know, the, the, the chief combatant, the Elohim of Psalm 82 is Melchizedek, who is also, for, for Second Temple Jews, the, the angel of the Lord, who is also Michael. Again, th- this, is, this is how they're thinking when they get to that passage. Now, 11 Q Melchizedek brings other passages into the profile. The Jubilee chronology is a big deal. You've got Isaiah 52, uh, Isaiah 61. And that is connected, of course, with the Day of Atonement, because the Day of Atonement comes after, again, the end of the Jubilee cycle and so on and so forth. So that's, a, that's you know, interesting, obviously, and I've already alluded to it, because of what happens in Luke 4. Isn't it odd or isn't it interesting? <laughs> isn't it fascinating that when Jesus starts his ministry, okay, when Jesus starts his ministry, he's there in Nazareth, Nazareth he goes into the synagogue. And he takes the scroll from Isaiah, okay, Isaiah 61. And I'm, I'm going to go there. And a, a lot of you will know this, but I think it, it's just more effective if I actually, you know, sort of read it and, and you, you get to hear what's left out. But he goes to the synagogue there in Luke chapter 4. And this is what, what we read here. He says, at verse 17, we'll go back to verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll. And found the place where it was written. I mean, he, he's doing this intentionally. He found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of, slight, of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You know, and he gets a mixed reaction, but he says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, look at this. He references the poor. He references the captives. He references the oppressed. Now, he's quoting Isaiah 61, but some of those terms are in Psalm 82. The writer of 11Q Melchizedek understood that. They knew that. I think Jesus knew it too, because you know later when we get to the episode in John, you know, he's going to quote Psalm 82. You know, we, I don't want to rabbit trail back into that, but here's, here's the point. Isn't it kind of fascinating that Jesus chooses this passage? And if you're familiar with Isaiah 61, you know, he, he stops you know, with set at liberty, you know, those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What he leaves out, okay, the next line in Isaiah 61, right after to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is where Jesus stops, the next line is, and the day of vengeance of our God 
to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, and so on and so forth. But he leaves out the day of the Lord line. Why? Well, it's kind of obvious. He knows. He knows why he's there. And it is not for conquest. He's there to die. But that's what they don't know. So if you know, if you're comparing what Jesus does, let's just imagine that you've got a few people there in Nazareth that day who have read 11 Q Melchizedek, or they think of the same thing. They're expecting, by virtue of, the, of that text and the, and the quotation of, of Isaiah 61, they're expecting a deliverer. They're expecting military conquest. They're expecting the final battle, because that's, that's just the picture. That's the picture that's in their head. And here you have this guy from Nazareth show up in your synagogue, and he says, today, today, this is fulfilled, you know, in your hearing. And, that, and then, you know, what, what's he going to do? He's going he's to go out from that point and start doing those things. He's going to heal people. He's going to preach the gospel. He's going to talk about the kingdom of God, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and eventually he's going to die and, and provide you know, redemption and atonement, which is associated with the Jubilee cycle, is it not? Uh, you know, that you just look at that picture. And he's both, you, you both get a holy cow moment, you know, out of people in, in, the, in the room there in Nazareth. And you'd also get, why did he stop there? Doesn't he know the scripture? Or, or maybe he's a pretender. You know, he's not going to deliver us. You know, you, you get all, all these sort of thought patterns going. Now, when we, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on, on this note, because, you know, we are drifting in the New Testament territory. And I think we've said enough about how how conceptually you could go from Melchizedek of the Old Testament and, and come out thinking of him as a divine being because of, again, this matrix of ideas. And here you have a, a classic example in 11Q Melchizedek of, of Jews doing this, doing this very thing and how they get there. I think we've said enough about that. But back when we did Ezekiel 40 to 48, part two, you know, when we talked about New Testament temple talk associating with, with the body of the Messiah, Jesus' body was the temple. His his followers are the temple. The church is the temple. You know, basically arguing in in favor of a of a more than literal approach, uh, because in in the first part we did two episodes on Ezekiel forty through forty eight. The first part we talked about the problems uh, that a literal approach uh, brings, but fundamentally a literal approach ignores over sixty references to jubilee language, jubilee concepts, and 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 other concepts that have to do with you know cosmic geography and you know, associated ideas in those chapters that you can look to the New Testament and you can see how those things play out, again, abstractly. Somebody emailed me after we did that and asked this question. They, they asked, hey, is there any, you know, this whole, all this Jubilee stuff, you know, was, was the day of Jesus' birth, that September 11th, 3 BC thing, was the day of Jesus' birth a Jubilee year? Um, I, I went and asked Mantello, again, my astronomer. And he said, uh, you know, no, it, it wasn't a Jubilee year. But he gave me the math on how to calculate from that date when the Jubilee year fell. And believe it or not, the Jubilee year fell in the year that Jesus began his ministry in the synagogue at Nazareth when he quotes Isaiah 61, which was really stunning. Again, if if you're tracking on, if if you're a Jew, I mean, and obviously not every Jew is going to be tracking all this stuff, but but if you're an educated, literate Jew, you know, and and maybe you've heard the birth traditions or something like that, but certainly if you're, you know, if you're toward the end of the first century where you have, you know, that this information, and you can look back on, you know, you're going to have a couple of the Gospels written there, maybe all of them, I guess, all of them by that time, and you have this episode in the synagogue, and you have this citation of Isaiah 1, and you know the Jewish tradition about the Messiah, and, and you, you know, you, you, you know what, what Jesus did and, and all this sort of stuff. That kind of thing is really remarkable. You know, that it, it shows Jesus, in, 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 in all the good sense of, of the word, Jesus is so calculated. He walks into that synagogue in the Jubilee year, and he, and he, you know, he takes the scroll and he finds the place. <laughs> he finds Isaiah 61 and he quotes it, but he doesn't include the day of the Lord stuff. And he just rolls it back up and hands it, hands it off, sits down and says, today, you know, today all this stuff is fulfilled in your, in your hearing. And he knows 
the, the range of reactions that's going to draw, in part because of the way people thought about not only Messiah, but Melchizedek. And later on, when whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, when he connects Jesus to Melchizedek, this is all part of a consistent picture. This is not novel when it comes to Jewish thinking. Jews were mentally there. The book of Hebrews, Hebrews is written to a Jewish audience. Okay, they understand because they have these categories in their thinking already. And you know, if, when you can show what Jesus did theologically, you know, what the what the result of the crucifixion was, and you can show how again in hindsight how the how the chronology of his life was intentional in, in certain ways. You know, we're, we're given certain pieces of information, like the birth. You know, I talk about this in Reversing Herman, like the genealogy. You know, we've got all this material out at this point. When whoever writes Hebrews and writes to that audience, a Jewish audience, you know, who, who are, you know, they're either, they're, they're either struggling with, you know, their acceptance of Jesus as the Messiah, they're, you know, teetering on the edge of doing that, and they're under persecution and all this stuff. Th these are not random things that the writers pull out because they don't know what else to put on, you know, on the piece of papyrus or, you know, the, the, the animal skin. They're building an intelligent profile that shows what Jesus did with intention, how God had this planned, how Jesus acted according to plan, and how it's consistent with their own reading, in many cases, of the Old Testament. It's not novel. The only thing missing for you people is who the second power really was. You have all of the boxes to put these things in. You've got all the file drawers. You understand the concepts. But it wasn't some other guy. It was this, it was this guy. It was, it was Jesus of Nazareth who did these things. Here is the, here's the playing out of his life chronologically, historically, and here are the theological concepts. You know, again, the, the file drawers that, that you've already got open in your head. You need to believe you, you, in, the, in the case of the book of Hebrews, you need to not forsake you know, the faith. You need to not surrender your belief. You need to not drift back into unbelief. And so, again, there, there's just a lot of intentionality going on here. I'm going to stop here because we will, we will pick up some of the thoughts again uh, in our next episode. We focus on the New Testament. We get into the book of Hebrews. But uh, again, the, the purpose of this episode is to help you to see how, again, what the New Testament says, you know, and what you've been taught, what you've heard probably at some point in preaching, it, it's, it's not a contrivance. Jews thought these ways about this person, Melchizedek. And hopefully it makes sense to you now how they could get there, how it would make sense to think this way, how they, you know, what dots they would connect to wind up where they did. And again, it works if there's legitimately a second power in heaven who fits this profile. And there was. And that's what we'll get into next time. More pieces to the puzzle, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. More, more dots, more pieces. More points of the mosaic, <laughs> whatever, whatever metaphor helps Absolutely. or hurts or hurts less. <laughs> well, maybe you answered some people's questions uh, out there. And uh, just a quick reminder, don't forget to be gathering your thoughts because after part three airs, you'll have about a week to send me uh, any questions you have because we're going to do a tire Q&A dedicated to your questions about the subject matter, Melchizedek. So, and um also, go vote for the next book that we're going to cover, Mike. Uh, the poll is live as we speak. I just sit there and hit refresh, refresh, just to see what the uh, status <laughs> is. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, well, I, I shouldn't laugh. I mean, I'll do that a couple times, too. You know, yeah. it's... I hear you. All right, Mike. Well, next week, we're going to take a break from Melchizedek, and we got an interview uh, mm -hmm. lined up. You want to tell us? Yeah, we have the uh, the authors. There's two of them of the book Surviving and Thriving in Seminary, an Academic and Spiritual Handbook. Now, I, I know the authors, uh, Danny Zacharias and Benjamin Forrest. Um, we're not doing this book because I think everybody who listens to the podcast is going to run out and take a seminary class. Um, I, we're doing this book because I, I really like the way it sort of offers really good advice on how to be a good student. And secondarily, again, not because it's less important, just number two thought here, uh, how to, again, not, not maintain your faith while, you, while you've got your head in all this academic stuff, even though there, there's an aspect to that, but just how to, 
how to how to be thinking in terms of application. You know, both uh, Danny and and Benjamin, you know, have a, have again a mind to serve the layperson with content. This is this is why we pick the things we do on this podcast. Uh, we we are interested in promoting the work and the effort, rewarding the effort of people who try to help you, try to help you know all of you out there in the audience, be good students of Scripture. And then transmit that to somebody else, you know, apply it to your own life and and help people apply it to their life. So this is a nice little handbook. Yeah, it's got seminary in the title, but don't be put off by that. It's just they just have good advice, you know, in, in both those areas. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 170, Melchizedek, part three. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. We're going to finally wrap up Melchizedek, at least sort of the Q&A anyway. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm ready for part three if you are. Sure. Well, let's, uh, let's just start with a summary. I mean, we've been through three previous episodes. We had parts, part 1A, part 1B, and then, of course, part 2. 1A and 1B were Old Testament, the Old Testament material about Melchizedek, and part 2 was the second temple literature that was relevant to uh, Melchizedek. And just by way of summarizing a few points that we hit along the way, we talked about how Melchizedek's name and his title, his title was the King of Salem or Salem, and the location, of course, of Salem was associated with Jerusalem, that the name and that title sort of associate Melchizedek with kingship, obviously, Jerusalem, again, obvious, righteousness, peace, and of course, priesthood. Uh, Those are all sort of ingredients for how the Messiah gets talked about. And so they're factors for what we're going to talk about today with respect to what the New Testament does with Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews in chapter 7. So, you know, there's, there's congruence there. We also talked about how the Aaronic priesthood is cast in Scripture as a concession by God. In other words, it was sort of a plan B because of Moses' unbelief. And we've, again, we, we've trodden over this territory before, so I'm not going to make too much of it here. But the priesthood of Melchizedek is a legitimate priesthood, and we will talk a little bit more about that specifically, that idea anyway. It's consistent with what we've already seen, that, hey, even though we have the priesthood of Aaron, the tribe of Levi, and all that sort of stuff, this other priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, was legit. Uh, It's it's not, this isn't what the plan B was. It was the Aaronic line that was the plan B. And Melchizedek, again, combines kingship and priesthood all into one. And that, as we talked about earlier, was sort of the ideal. And we're going to get that in the, in the Messiah, in the Messianic profile. We're going to get both sides, both elements. We also talked about the content matrix. So this is a term I've used for sort of all the things that kind of glom on to Melchizedek in terms of theological content. So we've got Melchizedek, who, of course, is associated with Abraham, and Abraham's seed, of course, are the Israelites, and one particular seed is going to be the Messiah. Melchizedek is associated with Elyon, the Most High, which is a term that's also associated with Deuteronomy 32. Again, that term shows up in Deuteronomy 32, the divorce of the nations, and of course, the flip side of that is the reclaiming of the nations, which is something that the Messiah would accomplish. So we have that set of data points uh, in relation to Melchizedek. Melchizedek also because of his association with Abraham. And in, if we bring Psalm 110 into the picture, we have an association with David in the Messianic dynasty. So he's associated with both of those major figures. David, again, would you know himself actually do some priestly things, but not a priestly line. But what God does is associate the Davidic dynasty with the priesthood of Melchizedek, the line of Melchizedek. And so that's why the Messiah gets associated with him. So we've got all these mutual associations. We've got, again, this thing that I refer to as a content matrix, all of these subjects sort of converging when it comes to Melchizedek. So that we have, again, this priest king figure, again, associated with Jerusalem as well. And it is, you know, again, just kind of an obvious profile. We have this combination of things we said earlier was consistent with kind of the Edenic ideal as well. Think of Adam. We have the original Edenic king in Adam. 
And we call him king because he was the one who was supposed to subdue the earth. He was supposed to rule the earth on God's behalf. And this is what the covenantal language associated with Adam says. His status also made him sort of a mediator on earth between God and the rest of humanity, his own descendants. Again, that was the, the original profile. That idea of combining rulership and mediation in one person continues through the patriarchs all the way up to Moses. Melchizedek becomes part of that profile, again, because of the incident with Abraham. But when you get to Moses, it splits. Again, the Aaronic priesthood is a concession. It's plan B. It's something that has to operate you know, in the background or alongside because of Moses' unbelief. So all of those things are important. You know, when we come to, again, what, what, how to think about Melchizedek. The last element that I should mention, though, is that at no point in the Old Testament material do we get any impression that Melchizedek was a divine being. Um, he's just, he's a human being. He's a priest. He's a king. Uh, I made the comment in a previous episode that he was the chief royal and priestly representative of the Most High God. That, act, that idea is actually going to become important for what we talk about today, really in explaining how in the world certain Jews during the Second Temple period began to view Melchizedek as a divine being. But again, the point at, at this juncture right here is the Old Testament itself doesn't really say that. It doesn't really call Melchizedek a divine being. But the fact that he is this main chief royal and priestly representative of the Most High God, again, in theory, between the Most High God and not just Abraham, but just generally, that is a significant idea, but it, it sort of gets misapplied or, or thought about incorrectly by some in the Second Temple period. Now, we know in the New Testament, which is what we're going to get into today, that Jesus and Melchizedek are, are going to be you know, compared. But I'm going to argue, again, that the point of the comparison is to compare Melchizedek to Jesus, not Jesus to Melchizedek. And that this is, this is going to be why we get some of this divine being sort of language and really how to parse it so that it's consistent with the Old Testament. Because again, the Old Testament does not have Melchizedek as a divine being. Now, in order to sort of straighten this out and both talk about why this error was sort of made, at least by certain Jewish writers, as a way to both deal with that and then segue into what the New Testament actually does. We need to, to camp for a few minutes at least on how Second Temple Jewish writers sort of made this association, how they, how they came to see Melchizedek as a divine being. So how, do, how did this happen? How, how does that trajectory occur? Well, there's really sort of two things we need to be thinking about in tandem. One is the fact that Melchizedek by virtue of his role as priest and king, again, and his relationship to this scene with Abraham, Melchizedek is sort of thought about because of that stuff as being the chief representative of Israel before God. And, you, you know, we could see how that would happen. You know, this chief priest, chief king, the, the main priestly figure, the main dynastic ruler figure. Well, naturally, if, if he is that in God's eyes, then he would sort of be thought of as the chief representative of Israel to God and before God. Now, once that association is sort of entrenched in your head, that Melchizedek represents Israel before God as its king and priest figure, then another association gets factored into it. And here's where the problem happens. And that is there is the prince language of the Old Testament. This association of priest-king with prince language, prince of Israel language, is how Melchizedek becomes a divine being in the minds of certain Second Temple Jews. Now, we need to unpack that. Here's how it's done. There are certain passages that use prince of Israel language. Daniel 10.21 who is Israel's prince in Daniel 10.21? Well, it's Michael. It's the archangel Michael. Now, Michael, of course, isn't called an archangel in the Old Testament. He gets that title in the New Testament and also in the Second Temple period. But Israel's prince is Michael in Daniel 
you get the same idea in Daniel 12, 1, where Michael is the great prince who has charge of your people. Again, speaking, angels speaking to Daniel. So there you have Michael is the great prince of the people of Israel. And so mentally, there were certain Jews that said, okay, Michael is the, is the prince you know, uh, of Israel. And Melchizedek is the chief priestly representative and the chief royal ruling representative. And this must be the same way, three different ways of talking about the same person. And so Michael becomes Melchizedek. There's another verse that gets factored into this, and this is in Joshua 5, Joshua 5, 14, where we have the prince of Yahweh's host. Now, some translations in English will have the captain of the Lord's host or the commander of the Lord's host or the commander of the Lord's armies, something like that. And, and this is clearly in Joshua 5. This is clearly a divine being because when Joshua asks, hey, who are you? He says, well, I'm the prince. I'm the Tsar. It's the same word as in Daniel 10 and Daniel 12 of Yahweh's host. Take off your, your shoes you know, from on your feet you know, because this is holy ground. It, it, it takes you mentally back to Exodus 3, the burning bush, where we have the angel of the Lord. So this is how, you know, the, this, this sort of concatenation of ideas happens. You have this notion that because Melchizedek is the chief prince and priestly figure, the chief representative to God, not just to Abraham, but to the people of Israel, that chief representation idea gets merged or glommed onto or conflated with the language of the prince of Israel that occurs a couple times in Daniel 10 and Daniel 12. And so that's how Melchizedek and, and Michael sort of get fused or united in the mind, uh, again, of some interpreters in antiquity, and also, you know, to be fair, some an interpreters nowadays. Now, do you see the problematic assumption, though? Do you see what, what the problem is if you think that way? The figure in Joshua 5 is the prince of the Lord's host. He's the prince of the heavenly host. Whereas Michael, in Daniel 10, Daniel 12, is the prince of Israel, which is earthly. They're actually talking about two different things, but nevertheless, they get conflated as though it was the same thing. And that's the problem. That's the mistake. You cannot presume the figure of Joshua 5 and Michael are the same just because they're both called prince. But some ancient Jewish interpreters did, and some modern interpreters do as well now. Now, the identification of the figure of Joshua 5 and Michael is also marred or messed up by the description of Michael in Daniel 10, 13. Here's why it's wrong. Here's why this association cannot be the case. On one hand, they're princes of different things. There's a disconnect. Joshua 5, that is the prince of Yahweh's host, his heavenly host, and Daniel 10, Daniel 12, Michael is the prince of Israel, which is an earthly people. So you have that disconnect, but there's another problem. That's Daniel 10, 13, the way Michael's described there. Michael is described as one of the chief princes in Daniel 10, 13. Now, if Michael is the prince, the commander of Yahweh's host in Joshua 5, if he's that guy, then that commander is but one of the commanders of Yahweh's host, because Michael is just one of the chief princes. So any of those other chief princes that aren't named could have been the captain, the commander of Yahweh's host back in Joshua 5. It just doesn't work. You don't have Michael elevated to a unique position. He's just one of a, you know, a small group for sure. But if he's one of the chief princes, then the guy back at, in Joshua 5, and there, and by extension, the one in the burning bush, is just one of several that hold that position, have that high status. And if that figure is just one of several princes, then you could have had any number, you know, again, at least more than one divine being occupying space with Yahweh in the burning bush. And, and that is just not the way that the angel of Yahweh is portrayed in the Old Testament. So that, that's actually a significant problem. Having Daniel's 10.13 tell us that Michael is just one of the chief princes, and he's not you know, this unique status by himself. Michael is clearly, put it another way, he's clearly not the highest authority in the heavenly sphere. He assists the divine man, quote unquote, who speaks to Daniel in Daniel 10, 13, Daniel 10, 21. And again, he's just one of the chief princes. Now that divine man 
just a little little bit of a rabbit trail here. The divine man back in Daniel, who's speaking to Daniel, I think, is the prince of the host from Daniel 8.11, and also the prince of princes in Daniel 8.25. And that guy is not Michael. He ain't Michael. That figure outranks Michael, who is just one of the chief princes. And again, the prince not of the whole heavenly host, but he's the prince of Israel. The prince of the host, again, the whole heavenly host of Daniel 8.11, again, is not Michael. And frankly, that prince, the prince of the host, the prince of princes, Daniel 8.11, Daniel 8.25, that guy sounds an awful lot like the guy back in Joshua 5, who is the prince of Yahweh's heavenly host, Yahweh's army. So to sum that up, again, to try to summarize all that, Michael is not the highest authority in heaven under God. He is not the second Yahweh. The second Yahweh figure outranks him. And if that's the case, then Jesus, who is aligned with the angel of Yahweh, who is the second embodied Yahweh, cannot be Michael. And I know, you know, like traditions like Seventh-day Adventists want to fuse Jesus and Michael. There are significant problems to it, especially Daniel 10, 13. Michael is just one of the chief princes. I'm sorry, but but Jesus is unique. The second Yahweh is unique because he is Yahweh. And I realize I'm using Unseen Realm lingo here. If if you're new to the podcast, you need to go back and read Unseen Realm. You need to, you know, the, the chapters on the word and the angel and the name and all that stuff, because this is where the idea of two Yahweh figures, you know, comes in. This is this is the Old Testament basis for the later Jewish teaching of two powers in heaven, two good guys, one of which was the lesser Yahweh. Okay. You have that figure, and that is not Michael. And so you, you have you know, some significant disconnects. And to sort of marry Melchizedek to Michael kind of compounds the problem. You don't need Melchizedek to be Michael or any other divine being to make sense of what the New Testament says about Jesus and Melchizedek. You just don't need it. But a lot of people sort of go down this road because they're thinking, based on what they read in Hebrews 7, that we have to have Melchizedek be a divine being or else Hebrews 7 is wrong or there's something going on there. And so, well, who, who could Melchizedek be that's a divine being? And some people will land on Michael like they did in the ancient world. And then you've got significant problems because then you've got the captain of the Lord's host back in Joshua 5 being just one of several equal guys in heaven. And then you got real problems when you have to import that back into the burning bush with the angel of the Lord, because the same language, take your shoes off, you know, from off your feet because you're standing on holy ground. The same language is used in both places. So when you, when you try to unite these things really on the basis of the word prince, okay, you've got problems. So where I'm at here is Michael is different than Melchizedek. Michael is different. Okay. than the prince of the host and the prince of princes, Michael is just what the scripture says he is. He's the prince of Israel. He is never called the prince of Yahweh's host, the whole thing. He is not the prince over the whole host. He is the prince of Israel. That's what he's called. So let's not conflate these figures and we can avoid some you know, serious theological problems. And then going back to Melchizedek, to repeat what I just said, you don't need Melchizedek to be a divine being in the Old Testament to have Hebrews 7 make sense. And that's where we're going to go now. Again, this is an episode that we need to orient to the New Testament, and the two passages are the end of Hebrews 6 and on into Hebrews 7. So let's read those. I'm going to read Hebrews 6, 13 through 20, which says this, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having waited patiently, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now on into Hebrews 7, starting with verse 1. 
For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. Now I'm going to stop there, in part because, again, it looks like we're going to be doing Hebrews, going through the whole book of Hebrews on the podcast. I want to focus on the language here used about Jesus and Melchizedek for this particular episode, because, you know, frankly, this is really what the episode is about. There are two interpretive options in scholarship for what I just read. We can either take what I just read literally, or we can look at it allegorically, okay, or or analogically might be a better way to say it. And I'm going to just read a, a few excerpts from some commentaries here just to, to just so that you see the difference between those two options. So the first one here is from Peter O'Brien, his commentary, The Letter of the Hebrews in the Pillar New Testament commentary series. He writes, These remarkable words have been understood in two significantly different ways. The first approach interprets without father or mother as divine predicates, which were well known in Hellenistic sources. Without genealogy, signifies unbegotten or uncreated and therefore of divine generation. While the crucial statement without beginning of days or end of life means that he was truly God and not merely a divinized mortal. On this view, Melchizedek is a divine figure, a heavenly being who is not part of this world. So again, that's one way, that's the end of the quotation. That's one way you can read this material in Hebrews 7. Of course, the problem is there's no hint of any of that in the Old Testament. Second Temple, you run into it, you know, here and there, like 11Q Melchizedek. But if you remember the episode we did on Second Temple period, there were other Second Temple writers that didn't think Melchizedek was divine at all. They just cast him as a normal guy. So there was a difference of opinion there. But again, if you you can read Hebrews 7 that way. Now, picking up with O'Brien again, here's the second way you can read it. The second approach takes the author's statements as an example of an argument from silence in a typological setting. Let me just break in here. So now we're, we're talking about typology here. And again, for those who may not recall or, or don't know, a type is a nonverbal prophecy. It is something in the Old Testament, a person, an event, an institution that foreshadows or prefigures something yet to come. There, it's an analogy to something yet to come. Back to Lane's quotation. I'll just start from the, where I was at. The second approach takes the author's statements as an example of an argument from silence in a typological setting. If the first clause, quote, without father or mother, without genealogy, unquote, is understood in purely human terms within a Greco-Roman context, then this would discredit Melchizedek. Without father meant being considered illegitimate. Someone without a mother was the child of a woman of low social status. And without genealogy meant that one was disqualified from being a Levitical priest, according to Numbers 3, verse 10 and verses 15 and 16. So that's the end of the quotation. What do we do with this? Because neither alternative seems really that great. The keys to unraveling this passage, you know, the end of Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 7, without disrespecting Melchizedek without making him an illegitimate you know, kid or something like that, but yet also honoring the fact that the Old Testament does not cast him as a divine being. The keys to, to sort of navigating this, there's really two things. Let, let's just start with the first one, again, in my view, and that those are the words without genealogy. That's an important qualifier because the point would be priestly qualification. Okay, not having a genealogy does not refer to a supernatural nature of Melchizedek. Okay, that he had no parentage or something like that. We'll get to the you know the other phrasing here, but without genealogy refers to the lack of a, of a priestly qualification. Now O'Brien, back to him, says this: although Melchizedek could not have qualified for the Levitical priesthood, okay, he, he wasn't you know Le- a Levitical. There was there was no tribe of Levi. Okay. This is Abraham's time. Melchizedek 
could not have qualified for the Levitical priesthood. He was still priest of God Most High. And Abraham recognized this. Moreover, since Genesis says nothing about Melchizedek's birth or death, his priesthood is cast as having no beginning or end. It was a divinely appointed priesthood that never ended. So you see the point here. You can take the language and say, oh, this refers to Melchizedek's origin as a human being. You know, well, he's not really human because he didn't have parents. He's a divine being. No, well, I mean, you can take it that way. But what O'Brien is saying, and again, where I'm landing, is that no, th this description refers to a priesthood God created that has no beginning other than when God had Abraham you know, encounter the, this meeting. It, it had no genealogical beginning. It isn't rooted in parentage. It isn't rooted in tribal affiliation. It is a priesthood because God says it is. It has nothing to do with human origin or human lineage or human tribal affiliation. And that is the point. When, when we get this, this description about having no father or no mother, the point is not to claim that Melchizedek is a supernatural being. The point is to claim that he doesn't have a genealogy that fits the priesthood and it doesn't matter. He is a, a priest of the Most High God because God said so. God approved of him. It had nothing to do with his birth circumstances at all. And not only that, by not giving us the father and the mother, by casting it this way, this is you know O'Brien's point, by casting it this way, it creates the implication, it suggests that this priesthood has no end to it. If it's not linked to human lineage, then by definition, it's not going to be terminated when that tribal lineage dies or that tribal lineage can't be determined by whatever you know, historical circumstance. It's independent of that. So, again, if you read it that way, again, you, you, you sort of avoid some of the other, the other problems, and it, it makes sense in its context. Now, again, if, if I would summarize this in, in my way, again, this is me talking here, you know, just in, by way of summary. The implication is that Melchizedek was still the priest of the Most High, regardless of ancestry. That's the fundamental point. There's no need to worry about Jesus, therefore, not being from the tribe of Levi and still being called a priest. This is a different priesthood, approved by God, one that is cast the way it is because it didn't originate with a tribe, and it's never described as having ended. The Old Testament is silent on Melchizedek's lineage and parentage for that reason. Again, this is the argument. It's silent on his mother and father because his priesthood does not depend on human lineage or tribal affiliation. It is not silent so that we can claim that or think that Melchizedek was a divine being. Now, as such, the physical succession to Jesus of Nazareth is not an issue. We don't even have to have Melchizedek related to Jesus to make the, the connection with Melchizedek legitimate. It doesn't matter because God has chosen this priesthood. That's why in Psalm 110, when, when God says to, to the dynasty of David, you know, you're going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, God just decided that. That's God's decision. I'm going to make you, the, I'm going to make you son of David, David, David dynastic offspring. I'm going to make you a king, but I'm also going to make you a priest. And I'm going to I'm going to select for the the analogy for the legitimacy of your priesthood this guy Melchizedek because his priesthood was something I decided it had nothing to do with physical lineage so don't worry about it you're a king and a priest these are God's decisions and it, what it what it really tells you it, in my mind anyway it really does speak again to the issue that the Aaronic priesthood was sort of an afterthought or a plan B or a concession because of Moses' unbelief. You know, God doesn't let that defeat his template, his ideal, going back to Adam, where you have king and priest in one person. That is still what God wants, regardless of the fact that he made a concession to Moses because Moses just couldn't believe and said, okay, you know, we'll make Aaron, you know, your spokesperson. And, you know, Aaron becomes the high priest. You know, you know God, had, God was merciful to Moses. And that's where we get the Aaronic priesthood. 
God doesn't need to stick with plan B to get what God wants. God goes back to the order of Melchizedek to merge the office of king and priest into one. Again, God's allowed to do that because he's God. You know, he, he endorses what he endorses. So we don't need to worry about questions of physical succession for Jesus to, to Melchizedek or anything like that. This whole thing was dictated by God alone. The silence of the Old Testament creates the impression deliberately that Melchizedek did not inherit his priestly service from a predecessor, and he remained a priest without a successor. His priestly line in God's mind is still in place and legitimate. It doesn't depend on a predecessor or a successor. And that's why the Old Testament is silent on Melchizedek's lineage. That's why the writer of Hebrews 7 says, without father or mother, having no genealogy. That's the point. The point is not to paint him as a supernatural being. Now back to O'Brien, just another little snippet from him. He says, consequently, Melchizedek foreshadows the priesthood of Christ at that point where it is most fundamentally different from the Levitical priesthood. In other words, it is a priesthood not dependent on tribal lineage. And end of quote. So that, I think, is, is the first thing that really helps understand, unravel what's going on in Hebrews 7 without making Melchizedek into something he's not. He's not a divine being and he's not an illegitimate child either. This is how we, you know, we need to approach it and read it, and it makes it makes good sense. Now, the second item in Hebrews 7 is, is in verse 3. There's a phrase in verse 3 where we read that resembling the Son of God, he, Melchizedek, becomes a priest forever. Now, note the wording. It is Melchizedek who resembles the Son of God. The point is not that Jesus resembles Melchizedek. And because Melchizedek resembles Jesus, his priesthood, Melchizedek's priesthood, is to be understood as being independent of lineage again. It's just another way of arguing the same thing. His priesthood is one begun by God and never terminated. And so while Second Temple texts thought about Melchizedek in divine terms, and the reason for doing so was wrong, it was, it was just misguided, the notion is still valid if one sees how the Messiah was a priest according to Melchizedek's priesthood and that, and that the Messiah, not Melchizedek, was the one who was divine. In other words, the idea that Melchizedek has something to do with a divine Messiah, that there's some relationship between Melchizedek and a divine Messiah, that's on target, but not because Melchizedek himself was more than a man. It's on target because Jesus, the son of David, was more than a man. Now, again, that, that's, that's sort of flipping it on, on its head, but I'm hoping, again, that, that you see the coherence of approaching it this way. Uh, a, a different commentator here, Lane, in his Word Biblical Commentary on Hebrews, he talks about a, a little bit about some of the, the finer grammatical points in Hebrews 7. And for those of you who have a little bit of knowledge of, of Greek, I think you'll appreciate this. Lane notes, quote, the events in Genesis have been read from the perspective of the eschatological reality they prefigured. Melchizedek has been assimilated to the Son of God. This is me breaking in now again. It's not that Jesus gets assimilated to Melchizedek. It's that Melchizedek gets assimilated to Jesus. Okay, back to Lane. This implies that the predicates applied to Melchizedek have been colored by the writer's conception of the eternal Son, Jesus. That explains why the description of Melchizedek in verse 3 appears singularly stylized. The perfect passive participle, and the Greek here is apho moi omenos, is a divine passive. This is me breaking in now. That's a grammatical term that some commentators use. Okay, The perfect passive participle is a divine passive, translated having resembled, more literally having resembled the Son of God, having been made by God to resemble the Son of God. The term presupposes God's appointment of Melchizedek as an illustration. I, I actually like the word a foreshadowing or a type. An illustration of the higher priesthood that the writer finds in the Old Testament record. The Genesis 14 narrative thus implies the kind of priesthood that was intended by God to displace the Levitical priesthood, namely the service of an eternal priest who exercises his priesthood continuously. It anticipates the appearance 
of a high priest who does not have any successor because he doesn't require one, unquote. And again, th this is what the writer of Hebrews sees. He's looking at Jesus first, and then he's thinking about Melchizedek. He's not looking at Melchizedek and then thinking about Jesus. So we need to be careful, again, how we how we articulate this, how we read it and articulate it. The point, again, is that Melchizedek was made by God to resemble the Son of God who would come down the road. Melchizedek is a type, a prefigurement of the Son of God who would come. This doesn't require Melchizedek be divine any more than we have to see Adam as a divine being because he functions as a type, a prefigurement of Jesus in Romans 5. Remember Romans 5, Jesus and, you know, the first and second Adam, all that talk. Well, you know, Adam wasn't a divine being. He was a human, okay? But Adam is a type of Christ. Adam doesn't need to be divine to, to function as a type of Christ. Well, neither does Melchizedek. Melchizedek was not a divine being in the Old Testament, and he doesn't need to be to do the job of prefiguring the Son of God, you know, who would be an eternal priest, an eternal mediator between God and men, okay? The writer of Hebrews is thinking about Jesus in those terms, and his mind is taken back to Melchizedek, not the other way around. So the part about paying Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek, I think, validates the point. This Melchizedek was a legitimate priest of the Most High, who deserved the tithe just like Levi would later. He preceded Levi, and his priesthood didn't extend from tribal lineage and never met an end. It coexisted once the Levitical priesthood appeared. It never went away. And the fact that it did, again, suggests that the Aaronic priesthood was a concession. Now, lastly, had any reader of Hebrews in antiquity known the chronology of Jesus' birth, and we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, I think that point, this point about his priesthood being transcended to Levi, would have been driven home even more that Jesus was the one to bring atonement and set the captives free by means of the connection of those ideas to the Jubilee cycle would have been highlighted by God's eternal foresight and use of Melchizedek to foreshadow someone who would be both the son of David and a priestly mediator considered by God to be superior to the line of Aaron. Now, how? How, do, how does that work? And what, what, what's, what about the birth? Well, for this, you need to be familiar with, again, my position. This is not just my position, but you know, my position that Jesus was born on September 11th in 3 BC. Now, we devoted a whole podcast episode to that. It's episode number 138 as to why you know, that's the case. And we provided newsletter subscribers anyway. So please subscribe to the newsletter and you get access to this. We provided newsletter subscribers with scholarly literature that validate that this position is not a contradiction. It's not irreconcilable. With Herod's death, there's a way to you know to fact to, to do the chronology there so that it works, based on Herodian coins and a few other things that are you know problems in Josephus that other scholars have tackled in the, in the peer-reviewed literature. So if you want that stuff, subscribe to the newsletter. You'll get it. Go back and listen to episode 138. So given that little bit of context, after the second Ezekiel 40 through 48 podcast that we did, that was about you know me arguing really that that. The temple vision there should be viewed as you know, viewed non-literally to to get our heads inside the jubilee idea because there are sixty references to jubilee stuff in Ezekiel forty through forty-eight. Sixty of them, actually a little over sixty. That's not an accident, folks. When you when you do it that many times, there's something going on there. There are over sixty links between the idealized temple and the jubilee cycle idea. After we did that episode, I got a question from Matthew in California that asked whether 3 BC, again, the, the birth year of Jesus, was a jubilee year. Now, the idea he was angling for was that the birth of Jesus would have marked the jubilee cycle. So what I did was I asked my astronomer friend, and for those of you who read my fiction, this is my Mantello character. I asked my astronomer friend about it and got back a really, really interesting answer. Okay, so here, here's part of his answer. He wrote, the year from 2 BC to 1 BC would have been a sabbatical year. The year 27 to 28 uh, CE, or that's that's another way to, to mark AD, was also a sabbatical year and a jubilee year, which means the birth year could not be a jubilee year. So that was the, the answer to Matthew's question in California, and I sent that to him. But he, my my source, my astronomer, continues. He says, the 27, 28, 
CE or AD period, the Jubilee period, coincides with the beginning of Jesus' ministry, which was inaugurated at the event in the synagogue at Nazareth, in Luke 4, 14 through 16, and even a little bit more beyond that. This is where Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 about the Jubilee language being fulfilled today in your hearing. That's what Jesus said. Today, you know, today in your hearing, this, is, this passage has been fulfilled. Now, there's some variability here. Some scholars, this is me talking now, some scholars, uh, namely Trochme and Yoder, have the Jubilee year at 27 or 26, as opposed to 28, 27. Jesus' inaugural sermon um, would, have, would have probably have begun either in 26 or 27. Let's just put it in either one of those years. We'll, we'll overlap both those figures, because at any rate, e- either of those dates align with a 3 BC birth and the statement in Luke 3.23, where Jesus, when he began his ministry, was, quote, about 30 years of age. So it aligns actually pretty nicely. Now think about the, the implications. Jesus walks into the synagogue in Nazareth to launch his ministry in a jubilee year. He knows it's a jubilee year. Then he quotes Isaiah 61, is stopping at Isaiah 61, verse 2, the first part of the verse. This is one of the passages that was central to 11Q Melchizedek. We talked about this in our last Melchizedek episode. They viewed 11Q Melchizedek, the writer there, viewed the coming of the Messiah was the coming of the Elohim of Psalm 82, who was about to set the captives free in fulfillment of the Jubilee idea. They read all of that. They read Psalm 82. If you remember the 11Q Melchizedek stuff, it gets into the war of gods and men and the, and the, the allotment of you know, the lot of Belial and the lot of Melchizedek, the good guys and the bad guys having this great conflict. Again, because the Messiah is supposed to set the captives free, set the nation free. That requires conquest and overthrow of their overlords. So they're processing the whole thing militarily. They process Psalm 82, Isaiah 61, all that through the vengeance you know, of God. But that's actually where Jesus stopped. Let me just read you. Let me just go to Isaiah 61 to per- get our memories refreshed. Here's Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And this is the passage Jesus reads. And as he inaugurates, he begins his ministry. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's where he stops. The very next line is, and the day of vengeance of our God. And that's what Jews of the period had in their head. But Jesus actually stops. He doesn't quote that part of Isaiah 61. Why? Because what he's there for, his liberation of the captives, is wider and frankly more significant than military conquest. Humanity was to be liberated from spiritual darkness and estrangement from God because of what he was going to do. He quotes this passage, but excludes the day of vengeance of our God, because what he's thinking about is much bigger than that. So now think about all of that and what we said earlier about the content matrix with Melchizedek. You have Melchizedek. He is he blesses Abraham. He blesses Abraham's seed. He is priest of El Yon, the Most High. The Most High God was the one who disinherited the nations in Deuteronomy 32. This particular seed of Abraham, Jesus, son of Abraham, also son of David, was the one who would reclaim those nations because he was also the son of David, the son of Abraham. Remember that the passages we read in the Old Testament sections about how it, these references to the scepter, by virtue of Psalm 110, the scepter not departing, you know, from the king. And I mean, he is the he's the son of Abraham. He's the son of David. He's a king and a priest. He gets associated with Melchizedek, who was also a king and a priest. And he Melchizedek was the king of you know of Jerusalem, the priest of Jerusalem. So there you get the Zion association there. All that together, again, this is what the Messiah, the messianic dynasty, was supposed to be. Jesus was a high priest, a mediator, and a king. He's the mediator according to Melchizedek's priesthood, the king according to the dynasty of David. He is the mediator between humanity and the Most High. He was the specific seed of Abraham who would reclaim the nations for the Most High. He was the son of David whom Psalm 89 verse 27 said would be made the Most High son of David over the nations. And his ministry, all of that, that, that's who he is. And it all began. The enactment of who he was and what it meant all began in Nazareth in a jubilee year. Again, with Jesus quoting 
Isaiah 61. Now that sort of planning, that sort of having all those threads converge and come together in this person, Jesus of Nazareth, if people were aware of that or even part of it, they're going to be looking at Jesus just like the writer of Hebrews did. This guy is superior in every way to the line of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. His dynasty was promised, again, to, to be an eternal dynasty, and a never-ending dynasty. In other words, it's not going to be terminated. And his priesthood is also never-ending because he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek by God's own decision. And that priesthood had no predecessor and no successor. And, and again, you look at all of these circumstances, all of these threads converging. Again, we, if we had these things in our head, we would look at Jesus just the way the writer of Hebrews did, like I just said, that this is something greater, far greater, both in terms of who he was and God's unbelievably magnificent planning to bring all this together. This one is greater and represents a greater truth than Aaron and the law and the ritual and the priesthood of Levi. There's just no comparison. And that's really the fundamental point in Hebrews 7 about Jesus and his relationship to Melchizedek. All right, Mike. Well, that's a lot of Melchizedek. Um... Yeah, there, there's more in Hebrews 7, again, to talk about. All right. Sounds good, Mike. We'll be looking forward to that uh, Q&A. And uh, I guess with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Mecca Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.